Hello and welcome to episode 69 of the In General Podcast. Today is your host, Chris, and I am joined by Stephen Ray Morris of Sea Jurassic Right. Good morning. It's a, it's a, How are you doing? It's a nice early morning here in Los Angeles, and uh, I'm really excited to just talk more toys. I mean, it's literally, I mean, I don't remember there being this quite of an announcement when Jurassic world came out. So I feel like there's so much more to chew on. And I feel like, yeah, I feel like we're, we're, we're still just barely scratching the surface of, uh, but hopefully today we'll, uh, I feel like today we're going to really dig in. Yeah, absolutely. No, when they, when they announced the Jurassic world toys, uh, I mean, like for the first movie, it, there wasn't really an event and this was really an event and it wasn't just toys. It was all sorts of merchandise. I mean, high end fashion apparel, Almost anything you can imagine they had. Um, Kitchenware, dog toys. The, exactly. Dress up. You can dress up your dog as a dinosaur. Um, I mean, I remember when, you know, when the announcements for the, the, you know, when Jurassic World products were starting to trickle out, I remember you posting and, you know, uh, on Jurassic Outpost, it was like there was the fruit snacks. And I remember everybody <laughs> desperately trying to find these things because it was like the first bit of new and it's like now, I mean, after this, all the announcements this weekend and the Entertainment Weekly article, it's like, all right, well, we don't have to worry about finding little Kellogg fruit snacks. There's so much more here. Yeah, there really, there really is so much more. In fact, it is absolutely overwhelming. Um, if you're like a collector who's a completionist, you're going to be in for a, uh, a a really interesting time going forward. Um is- yeah, it's there's so much. I was going to ask right off the bat: Are you a completionist, or are you a uh, are you a uh, um, pick and choose? Um, so, <sighs> with the Mattel toys, I'm hopefully. I mean, I don't know what I'm going to do with them. To be entirely <laughs> candid, but um, I, I I do hope to pick up the entire Mattel line. Uh, uh as for other things, I, I like them. Uh, it just it really just depends on like I, I can't fill my house with them. Um, my apartment with Jurassic Park stuff. Um, yeah. I, I love Jurassic Park, but I, I need to be reasonable, especially if I'm going to move. Oh, um, yeah, for sure. And, like, I like other things. I, I don't want my entire house just to be, like, a toy display or something like that. You know, I, I tend to like a more simplistic, streamlined approach. And then, like, one little corner of, like, fuck, yeah, that's Jurassic Park. No, I, I'm, I'm 100% with you. Like, I, I'm so envious of, you know like the really great Jurassic Park collection, uh, you know, having the shelves with the things. I think Brad Jost from uh, the Jurassic Park podcast, I feel like I've seen pictures of his setup and it's just kind of like, I mean, he's not a completionist either, but it's just like, I think like the next time I move, I almost want to design a little, like you're saying, like a little nook. And I mean, yeah. I, f- I feel like with the, at least just, you know, my first impressions of the, of all the Fallen Kingdom stuff, I, and I feel like maybe this and maybe we'll get into it as we go, you know, as you go through your experience going to the toy fair and the universal event and stuff. But it seems like the Legos are like the kind of, you know, we were so excited for Jurassic World, but then the Legos for this year are kind of, uh, you know, they, they're not as cool because now there's so much stuff that's even better almost. Uh, yeah, no, I actually that is something that I do want to talk about because I, I mean, I honestly left with such a candidly authentic excite, you know, I'm really happy about everything. Um, yeah, the Lego kind of failed to impress me. The Lego lineup, there's nothing outwardly wrong with it. It just sort of feels like a retread of, um, the 2015 lineup in a new skin, but I'll, I'll talk more about that later. Cool. Um, uh, so so in case you haven't fully been following, Toy Fair um, happened in New York City uh, Saturday through Tuesday. And uh, they revealed a ton of Jurassic World and Jurassic Park merchandise for the first time, including Mattel's uh, Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom toy line. Big coming and, out. Big coming out for them. You know, this was, yeah. our, this was our first look at what they had uh, ha- and, have in store for us. What's especially interesting about that is this is Mattel's first time doing a Jurassic Park toy line. So it was previously Hasbro who owned the master license, and before them it was Kenner. But Hasbro had acquired Kenner, so it was never really like the license went from one hand to another. It just, they adapted 
the Kenner molds. They adapted the Kenner team and they made that transition. So it was never, it never went to like an entirely new team. Like it eventually shifted from internal teams, but it never went to like a completely different um, toy studio really. Oh wow. Even though yes, Kenner was a different toy studio, but you know what I mean? Like since they acquired that company, it Kenner became Hasbro. Well, I mean, I mean, that's just from my history of the toys growing up that there seemed to be a general consistency from Jurassic Park to Lost World. Mm -hmm. Um, And then then Jurassic Park 3 happened. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Like, I feel like, like, in my mind, that's when it like shifted from Kenner to Hasbro, even though Hasbro had acquired, I feel like they had acquired the license a little bit earlier than that but i think they had acquired it like right during the lost world i mean my my kenner history isn't exactly up to snuff right now so i know people are listening to this giving like dude it was like this day on like 1998 yeah. why don't you know this chris you like these toys so much you should know this um they they, they walked into the off kenner offices and they're like you're ours now um yeah no i mean i remember i mean i'm just like kind of just googling the box art for the lost world toys and I feel like, yeah, I feel like they, yeah, they say Hasbro on them. I okay. Think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, but, yeah. I, if I recall correctly, though, the Kenner offices were left open at that time. So, like, basically when they acquired Kenner, they still let kind of Kenner, even though it was working on the Hasbro level, they still had, like, their own offices and teams. And if I recall correctly, the Kenner team still worked on the Lost World toy line, even though they had been acquired by Hasbro a few years later. It's sort of like the... Like say Disney acquired Lucasfilm, but they're still yeah. Lucasfilm. Um, um, the difference I, is is Hasbro eventually folded and closed the Kenner offices, and by the time JP three rolled around, it was a pure like Hasbro line. Um, I'm actually corrections. I'm I'm looking at these boxes now in more detail, and they do say Kenner. So um, okay, yeah, um, yeah. So they're so could, yeah. By that point, it, like you're saying, they uh, yeah. I mean, and, and I wonder if that was like a branding thing too, where it was like. Even though, I mean, I guess you're, I guess it's that thing where it's like, yeah, it's still, it's still the original Kenner team, despite, you know, new ownership or whatever. Yeah, exactly. I'm trying to see when they were purchased by Hasbro. Um, Their parent company was Hasbro in 1991. Wait, no, that can't be right. That's, I feel like, yeah, I I saw that once too. And I'm always like, I wonder... (laughs) I, like it'd be so interesting to talk to I wonder like I'm always so curious where these where the people who created these toys are now you know are they still are they still oh. making toys for these companies or are they have they moved on to something else you know it's kind of funny because I mean I I, uh, I mean I try to reach out to as many people as possible and then I have a lot of collector fa- friends and um quite a few of them are still in the industry um I don't think any of them really love Hasbro, <laughs> but um, quite a few of them are still in the industry. Um, quite a few are reti- retired or quite a few of them have kind of transitioned to different parts of the industry that still still, still deal with like brand building and creative uh, items, but like not necessarily the same place. Like they might actually, you know, rather than work being a toy designer at Hasbro or Mattel, now they might be like a brand manager at like Universal Pictures, you know, and Got working it. like uh, on from like the film studios end to work with their toy partners, um, things along those lines. Got it. But um, yeah, I, th- I think I find it really interesting. By the way, uh, Kenner was closed in two thousand, so like oh, a wow. year before Jurassic Park three toys. So wow, that sort of explains what happens. I mean, not to diss the sculpt detail on those toys because the sculpt detail is nice. I didn't like the art style. I didn't like the the style of the toys, but like there was some good artistry on display nonetheless. Yeah. I mean, I think the dinosaurs questionable choices. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't, yeah, I almost don't know if the dinosaurs were the problem. It was just the change in size. I think really, I think to me, it seemed like miffed a lot of people and, and miffed cause it just was like, so jarring. All the dinosaurs were the same. Your T-Rex was the si- same size as a Raptor. They all had, permanent mortal wounds over them they were posed in oh yeah the really p- weird <laughs> twisted like yeah the brach- action poses yeah the brachiosaurus i remember was like every yeah, everybody was like in weird ri- rigor mortis style situations he, 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 the whole line was just sort of weird um it just didn't feel like a the, the play the playability was just kind of out the window and it was small and it just wasn't fun it wasn't innovative and uh it just wasn't Jurassic Park, man. No, and and I mean the Jurassic World. I mean, 
I mean, maybe you have more insight to this, but like, I mean, there was some figures that were actually pretty cool in the Jurassic World toy line. Like I have the Mosasaur, I have um, Charlie, I have, and then I have the Dilophosaurus, I think, but that's pretty much all I got from that toy line. But it like the Dilophosaurus is probably, probably my favorite. I have some issues with it. Like it's weird frill on those loose hinges. So it just flops back and forth, but it, yeah, it's what's a the decent, point? <laughs> it's a decent sculpt. Yeah. Um, I know. I I remember when I was at Comic Con. I think around that time when they lost when Hasbro when they announced Hasbro had lost the license, and I remember being at Comic Con, and the Mattel booth and the Hasbro booth were right next to each other. And I just remember that being like <laughs> Ooh, awkward and like I can't even imagine what I mean. Again, as you as you talk about your experience at Toy Fair, I don't know if like Hasbro was like right next door. I don't know how the no. layout or any like if you, like I'm curious to like. I mean, again, like I'm, I'm, I'm. Hasbro was like locked away, hidden, like far in the distance. Like you really had to go to find them. And then they had a larger booth once you went inside of it. But um, Mattel, when you walked into the main ent- entrance, I mean, I assume it was the main entrance. Um, you literally walked in. There were the registration tables, and then there were two escalators. Like there was like a drop down to the floor below. And then from your floor, it kind of went out and hugged on either side. And then there are two escalators going up to a floor. And up there, you saw this giant Mattel sign. And then there was, like, this staircase in this doorway. And, like, they had this entire floor to themselves up there. And, like, you just walked in and you saw, like, Mattel just, like, floating above you. And uh, if you would go up the escalators before you went checked into the Mattel booth, you could just see the Jurassic World gates inside of the... Uh, like inside the booth and it was like dark and had all this like cool dramatic colored lighting and the dress world gates. And it was just like, you're like, Oh, okay. I see you, Mattel. <laughs> we've, um, we've no, I mean, it, they, they felt like they were raining over toy fair. And, um, especially after you see the items, I, I really concur, but I am jumping ahead of myself. Yes. Um, because I want to talk about on Friday, universal pictures held a special, uh, event and it was basically a merchandise preview event. Um, and they invited some people along to go there. Uh, apparently Bryce Dallas Howard and Frank Marshall were there earlier in the day. Um, yeah, I saw photos and, of uh, them posted online, uh, like of them. Yeah. Uh, she uh, didn't, didn't, um, Bryce Dallas Howard introduce, uh, a, a few of her items. Exactly. Yeah. I think she was on the Jurassic World Instagram story and, um, things along those lines. And, uh, yeah, no, she kind of did, like, a small little preview. And then they had um, various members of press and industry uh, come in and, like, just, you know, it was like, I mean, it couldn't have been more than, like, five people at a time. And there weren't really that many people that went there because they let myself, they let me stay a little bit longer because they knew that I'd want to do a deep dive. Um, They just basically said, hey, once you're past this time appointment, we're going to have to talk to the other people that are in here. So just, you know, but they're like, keep playing with the toys. Take pictures <laughs> That's that. cool. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, what was that like? Did, was it a kind of a thing where you show up in New York, you are staying at a hotel and then they were sort of like arrive here at this time, you get a badge, you go in and then are you given certain rules about what you can do with the toys? Because <laughs> I imagine like for myself and I think, I mean, and what, uh, you know, you took a lot of amazing photographs and I think a lot of, I feel like the Jurassic community is, was super excited to see all those photos because you, you took a lot of close-ups, you know, because it's like, we want to know what the skin's going to be like. We want to know what the detail, the articulation. So was that like, and did you go in with a plan to like what you were going to try and capture or was it sort of just get as much as possible? So, I mean, yeah, get as much as possible was sort of my concept. But, yeah, no, I wanted to get pictures of, like, the close-up of the skin, get an idea of what the paint looks up really close, look at the articulation, um, find out what's stamped underneath the feet of the dinosaurs. Where is the um, copyright information? What does the copyright information say? What is the new Jurassic World symbol, like the mark of authenticity? Um, what are, like, if there are there QR codes on these dinosaurs? <laughs> what do they look like? Where are they? Um, I, you know, let's get a close up of the eye. How are the eyes painted? Are they hand painted or are they a print decal? Um, little things like that. I really wanted to make sure that every element was captured to the extreme that I would have wanted to see. Like if I were a kid, again, 10 years old, sitting at home, looking at toy fair pictures and being, you know, and going, oh, why didn't they get close ups of these toys? And oh, but look at that toy in the background. Why did nobody get a picture of that? And you go from like <laughs> website to website trying to find these pictures and you like still never find exact. I wanted to basically get as many photos as I could. Now, um, 
Yeah, to jump to jump backwards a little bit. Yeah, so I arrived in New York City uh, on Thursday evening. I stayed at the uh, Moxie Hotel in Times Square, which, by the way, great hotel. Nice. Um, uh, I really, I really dug it there. It took me a little bit to figure out how to use the elevator, though. Super <laughs> high tech. Um, uh, and um, yeah, so the event the next day was at one p.m. and it was at the Copacabana um, in Times Square. Or right outside Times Square, it was in New York City. It was within walking distance. Oh, cool. um, and uh, yeah, so I brought my camera. I actually brought a little like roll along suitcase with some extra gear, like a tripod and a few other things. I ended up not using that stuff, but I brought it just in case um, because I really just wanted to be prepared. I mean, I had my laptop in there just in case I needed to like do something right then and there. Ultimately, I didn't get around to uploading stuff until I got back to my hotel, but um. Yeah, I, I brought a lot of things with me. Um, it was actually just kind of funny. You know, you walk up to the check-in desk, you give your name, and they're like, awesome, okay. And, like, someone, you know, um, a few people from Universal came out like, oh, hey, Chris, you know, I'm, they introduced themselves to me. Um, and then I, I kind of had a, a guided tour from Annalisa from Universal Pictures. Okay, uh, cool. And, um, I mean, it was basically there weren't – there was no, like – I was a little shocked at there. It was like, okay, go go in, enjoy, do what you want. Like I'm like, okay, okay. <laughs> uh, is is that? Yeah, so, can we so, touch this? Yeah, was that so? Then for this kind of stuff, are you, is it? Uh, yeah, I mean, my assumption would be that this stuff would be very almost like visiting um like a like a set junket or something where it's like very controlled. But so like that. And and the other the other thing I was curious about is that because I noticed some stuff was in the box and stuff some stuff wasn't was it almost just like what's ready or or like did you get the impression that like we just want you to see these particular toys now and not others or well they did not want to um, steal the thunder from Toy Fair from Mattel for one thing they still wanted Mattel to be able to have quite a few reveals themselves so the idea was to show a sampling of products from all their key partners. Um, Got it. As you can imagine, Mattel is probably the most robust partner, so it had the largest focus of the show. Um, it, but yeah, I mean, so when you walked in, immediately in front of you, well, right before you walked in the room, there's sort of like a room with like hors d'oeuvres and drinks, and there was one of those uh, Ruby's costumes for Blue. Oh, nice. Uh, the blow up costume. So Blue was just kind of standing there by the door guarding it. <laughs> and then you walk in, it's a really nice lit up room. And uh, right in front of you are the two Power Wheel vehicles. And um, a display, like, with, like, a little mannequin, like, of a kid, I think, wearing, like, a Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom t-shirt. Um, and then you sort of, if you follow the floor plan, you just kind of meander to the left, and you start with a lot of um, fashion products. Um, and so, like, I mean, they're from partners, like, Forever 21, and, um, I mean, there's, like, there's a lot of um, partners I don't know, because some of them, they, they're only going to be available overseas in like china oh wow um, so like if you want to get them you'll have to import them yourselves um because china apparently has a really really solid jurassic following um so having exclusive merchandise over there for apparel made a lot of sense to them but they still showed them off which i really appreciate it's not like it's not like they're being shy about having these items i mean it's still something that we're able to see at the showcase um is is somebody guiding you or are you really just kind of left to just it like is there is it almost like a museum where is there like a a brand person like standing next to like the backpacks or like the dog sort of. Okay, cool. S- sort of. It, okay. So like what I, I don't know if everyone um, always had like one guided person with them, but uh, Annalisa was really excited to kind of uh, talk to myself as well as I'm, um, I'm going to butcher his name, his last name, but um Tim Ciafano who came in and helped me take photographs and just kind of was an extra, uh, an extra camera on the event and also an extra super fan to be able to enjoy it. Um, that's awesome. So, so him and I, you know, we got a tour from Annalisa essentially. And she started walking us through the products, telling us a little bit about them. Um, and no, it was really interesting. There was some really nice, um, there's some high end fashion for Jurassic. And I believe the partner was Gen Art. Um, yeah. I remember seeing that on, I think on your, on the Jurassic Outpost Insta stories. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and then I think, let me see, there was Muxin, 
I'm not exactly sure where that's going to be available. Um, Where's that amber is... necklace going to be available? <laughs> so, okay, apparently, I said that amber necklace was like, what, I think I thought it was 44000 I'm looking at a press sheet right now. I think it was $48,000. Oh, my God. Um, <laughs> it was so funny because um, when they when they told us that, you know, you kind of expect a certain uh, facade of like, you know, and this is our amber necklace worth $48,000. Like, but rather it was like, yeah, we have an amber necklace. That thing's like $48,000. Like, like the absurdity of the price point wasn't lost on the people there. Like, I mean, everyone thought like, yeah, it's a wonderful piece. It's just kind of crazy. It's part of our Jurassic World collection. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, so like, it's sort of like looking at it in like a little bit of awe and shock. And I mean, it was a beautiful piece. I would have never guessed it was that much money. But then again, I guess I don't often look for <laughs> Golden amber neck. Yeah, you're not you're not following the the amber market. The high, yeah, the high fashion amber market. Yeah, exactly. But um, yeah. So you know, you started with uh, the different pieces of merchandise, and there's some really nice um, there's some really nice clothing articles. I especially liked how many um elements of women's fashion there were there. Um, from dresses to different types of articles of clothing and then um, men's jackets. And it was just a lot more of um, in the past, there's basically just been sort of boys t-shirts or like men's t-shirts that are sort of designed like a boys t-shirt. Yeah. Extreme. That's about it. Yeah. And that's like about it. But really what they had is like a lot of really cool, subtle things on display. And I definitely appreciated it. And I'm going to be very interested to see, uh, just, just kind of get an idea of what these look like once they start hitting stores. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, that's, I mean, to me, that's always like my not problem with Jurassic Park apparel is, is that ultimately a lot of it's always just the same, which of course we love the Jurassic Park logo, but it's like, there's only so much you can do with it. But even just looking at some of these like, um, like fern pattern stuff, and then there's like this yeah. dr- dress with the like, uh, Stan Winston Raptor kind of like print like it just seems like there's more of an imagination here about like it's, how to make how to like almost like like the Jurassic Park uh, lifestyle kind of thing as opposed to just a logo or and let me tell you I am getting logo fatigue um, <laughs> Jurassic Park logo fatigue because it just it hasn't really changed much over the past few years it's thrown on everything and it's so big and it's oftentimes not aesthetically pleasing in the way that it's used like in terms of like movie posters like when you have these movie posters like dress world posters where it's like character art and dinosaur art, and then there's that logo it just doesn't look right I think it would look better if it was just the font face saying the title in the movie I don't think it should always be the entire full logo yeah um, yeah it's funny that they don't actually they don't there's not that many I don't I can't think of any examples off the top of my head where it's literally just the logos. The Mark the Mark Angler poster from Comic Con. Yes, was you're right. just the font face, and it looks beautiful that way. Um, so yeah, I would love to be able to see the faith of the brand being strong enough and the recognition being strong enough that they don't have to put the logo on everything. Like, I mean, on the tag, sure, throw the logo. But I mean, just on the front of the shirt, I don't really want to always wear this logo if I'm wearing something Jurassic or um, or if I have an art print or something along those lines. It just, it, it's a little, um, it's a little much sometimes. Well, again, it's, you can only have so many of the same t-shirt. Um, I actually just noticed that um, just going through, like I have your, um, Facebook albums, the dress scout on the dress scout post page on Facebook, <laughs> there is that shirt of like kind of like almost not psychedelic, but um, t shirt where it actually does have the Jurassic Park, but it's not, it, it looks a little bit different, but there's like a t shirt that just has the, um, just has the phrase Jurassic Park above it without the full logo. Oh, nice. I need to go through those images and look again because <laughs> I've really been, um, the thing is, is, I found that all, I loved it all. But the Mattel stuff was literally what I, you know, was really looking forward to. And it's especially what people had the most questions about. So I wanted to really make sure that I covered the Mattel products in full. Yeah, no, totally. Um, I mean, that's what from just just seeing just seeing, you know, the again, it felt like it, it, Friday and Saturday felt kind of like um, when the Fallen Kingdom trailer first dropped. It was like everyone was online and just being like, what's this? What's the wait? What's going on? Like, wh- who's, the, you know, like, wait, why is there like a green raptor? Like, you know, everyone just had all these so questions. That, is, that, is, that green raptor is something that I can get into. Um, if we'll, we'll get to that here in a few. Um, 
But anyways, yeah, I walked through the fashion showcase, and um, you come up to the Mattel toys. And, of course, the entire time I was eyeing up the Mattel toys, <laughs> because I was looking at And, like, it was totally noticeable, because, like, I'm, you know, I keep glancing, and I'm like, I, you know, I'm looking at this, I'm like, oh, this is a really cool shirt. And I go to look to my right, but my eye catches, and I go, wait, is that the Indoraptor over there? I'm like, I guess the cat's out of the bag there. Yeah, I, um, I, yeah, I feel like... Yeah, once you look there, it's like that just opens up a like Pandora's box of questions and stuff. And it, exactly, it was hard not to um, because I mean it was also the biggest mystery. Despite there being some leaks, there was just so there were so many questions about those toys. You just really didn't know what they were going to look like or um, how they were going to work or how they were going to feel or how big they were going to be. Yeah, no, but I mean, um, yeah. So yeah, I worked my way through the fashion and I came up to the Mattel toys. And uh, <laughs> what was your first reaction? I, I mean, I was just really excited to see it. Uh, I think maybe my first reaction was how slick the packaging looked yeah. and how well the toys presented in the packaging and how they made really good use of space. Um, whereas a lot of toys on the market right now, they have a lot of um, empty space in the packages, so it takes up more retail shelf space. These were just the right size. Everything was sort of packed down where it didn't look like it was a budget item, but it still didn't take up as much space. Um, the human toys, for example, are a good example, uh, a good, good example of that because they don't, they're not quite as big as the three and three quarter inch packaging that, uh, Hasbro like Star Wars toys use. Well, even, um, even the, um, even the, uh, attack packs, uh, mm-hmm. like the Stiggy Moloch, Stiggy, Stiggy Moloch, Stiggy Moloch. St- I think it's a Stiggy Moloch. Stiggy um, Moloch. Um, that's yeah. how I say it, but man, dinosaurs are complicated. Yeah. The Hararosaurus. Actually, that was, I mean, that was my, and I don't know if you got the sense of this either on, on the preview day or on the, or the next day, but like, what is the biggest difference between those? I mean, I know the price points for those attack pack and roar of wars are different, but is it just amount of detail? That's the difference between those two. Well, the size, I mean, so, you know, I really wish I would have asked like the actual average length of an attack pack dinosaur and the average length of a Roarvor. But if I just had to go and hazard a guess, um, an attack pack dinosaur is on average going to stand about three inches tall and be about five inches long tops. Mm -hmm. Um, And they're they're small. Um, They're properly scaled to a three and three and three quarter inch human action figure. So, you know, they're, they're, they're tiny. Um, in your hand, but they're not miniature tiny. They're just, you know, they're small. They're yeah. a basic dinosaur. Whereas the Roarvors, I don't know, they might be like 9 to 11 inches long. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. yeah, my initial thoughts when I had seen Roarvors in the past in photos, I thought they were probably about Jurassic Park 3 electronic dinosaur sized. And I was very surprised when I saw them in person how much larger they actually were. Oh, cool. Um, they, yeah, they're definitely larger. But yeah, so the attack packs, they are $7.99. Same with the human action figures. They are $7.99. And uh, right away, what struck me was like the value of the items. Um, the human action figures had a lot of articulation. In fact, it wasn't immediately noticeable. But, um, you know, I once again, I never got the exact like articulation points or anything. Yeah, but like the shoulders all seem to be ball joints. Um, there seem to be like, um, swivel bendable, um, elbows and knees. And I think the hips were ball jointed oh, as cool. well. I mean, uh, which gave you a wide range. Yeah. I mean, it's, I feel like this is what people, I mean, obviously we love having the dinosaurs again, but I think that's the thing that we, and, and, and I don't remember what the full details were with Hasbro, but wasn't the, having the Owen figure and the motorcycle, wasn't that really like a last minute, like, Oh shit, we dropped the ball kind of thing. I, yeah. At a point in time, Hasbro did have like a proper Jurassic world toy line planned. And like, I don't know how far in development it actually went, but eventually they just opted for like miniature, like one and a half inch, two inch tall. Deep sea like, diver. Point of arti- <laughs> yeah. Humans and uh, no action figures. And, um, yeah, that, that Owen and motorcycle set was definitely like just a, oh, I guess we should do this type of thing. Um, th- this line from the ground up. Um, so what's really interesting about the Mattel toys, the, the core action figure, assor- action figure assortment, um, is built around the three and three quarter inch human action figure. So 
every skew scales appropriately and has the proper dinosaurs in those skews. So, Amazing. you know, you're, you're, you're not going to have a Velociraptor Roarvore that towers o- over the human figures. The the Velociraptors are always going to be in attack packs or bundle packs and be properly scaled. Um, same with you're not going to have a miniature T Rex or a um, or like a miniature Allosaurus. Even you know those are going to be part of the Roarvores, and then the Super Strikes are slightly bigger. Or those called action attacks now. The name kept changing. I don't know. Um, but, um, yeah, and it just kind of goes up from there. And certain items have their own individual uh, skew, like, you know, as you saw, like the Mosasaurus, the Indoraptor, the yeah. Tyrannosaurus Rex. But everything is properly scaled within one another. Um, and it adds a really good play pattern and cross compatibility between all of the different items. Oh, that's and so cool. uh, it, it, it's akin to what Kenner did. But I would even say that it probably takes scale into consideration more than Kenner did. Although Kenner definitely did a great job. Occasionally they would do something like, you know, a smaller Spinosaurus. Um, they, they would break yeah, their yeah. own rules. I remember that, and yeah. It, yeah, and it doesn't look like Mattel is breaking their own rules on this one. Like wow. they, they kind of set a scale rule and they are adhering to it. Wow, that's really now, cool. Now, I mean... Obviously, there might be small little variations, but what you're not going to have is like a towering Velociraptor <laughs> or a miniature T-Rex. Like, you know, they might be like, oh, well, the Triceratops technically should be two inches longer. But in the reality is like, it's not that big of a difference. It still feels like the right size of item to the human toy. Um, well, then would, so then the, then the, they're all baby, they're all baby dinosaurs essentially that come with the figures. Um, so the only baby dinosaur I saw, uh, and this might be the one thing that's sort of breaking the rule, I suppose, is the one only baby dinosaur I saw was Owen with Baby Blue. Um, the other figure packed with a dinosaur at the time was a mercenary figure, and he came with a smaller red dimorphodon. Um, because it was a dimorphodon, it didn't really bother me, but it wasn't sculpted like a baby. Oh, um, hmm. And seeing some of the preview images... It sort of looks like they're using the art style of the minifigures for some of the other humans that are packed with a dinosaur, but not all of them are packed with dinosaurs. Yeah, that's the one thing I noticed um, that was so interesting that there's that there's a couple figures that aren't packed with dinosaurs, and I wonder, I wonder, I I wonder what they, that is. Yeah, I think they have more. They have, they're like more plastic heavy on the gear, and they have more um, playability with the gear. I know it's it's so, fu- it's funny though because it's like I'm looking at all the different. Um, I have a photo up from entertainment weekly of all the uh of all the figures and it's there i mean there's owen with like crazy armor but for the most part the toy the 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 weapons and accessories aren't oh as over the top as the original kenner toys as far as i can tell it's all movie accurate except for that owen um which i don't know what's going on with that owen like if that's something in the movie i'm gonna be yeah, really interested to see yeah. how on earth that play, pl- plays out. Yeah, um, seriously. He's like, there's a scene where he just has to like, it's a, it's like he has to just go into a, a, a thing, like a, a a room filled with ankylosaurs and he just has to like take the hits or something. I don't know. That was, <laughs> yeah, just it's it's really interesting looking armor, uh, to say the least, though. Um, I do like that the armor is a ta- detachable from the figure. If you see in our picture, because we have a picture of it carded in the box, uh, it, you know, the body armor fits over his body and then the arm plates snap onto his arms. And then he's got like this shield, um, which he can, <laughs> then he can hold. I mean, but, um, he's just, he's just trying out to be Captain America. Um, I, yeah. Right. I, I don't know. It's, it's an interesting thing. It's going to be funny if like, it turns out that this is going to be part of like a flashback scene with baby blue, but maybe when she's like an adolescent and like, he's like, has some sort of like, protection armor while dealing with her i, I really don't know oh, like like um, it, police or like dog gear when they're like training to be like when they're training yeah, police dogs because it does say dinosaur trainer owen is the name of the toy oh yeah you're right that's crazy um so another thing i want to make note of is weirdly that entertainment weekly image um it used some final toys and it used some early prototypes oh really um in fact, that was the same thing with a lot of the Entertainment Weekly images. Um, like, some of the items were just earlier prototypes. I guess they never took a pro shot of their final production model. Um, so, for example, in the Entertainment Weekly image, you see the mercenary with a um, with uh, a dimorphodon. 
and he is wearing like a yellow vest and then like a brown t-shirt underneath it. Yeah. Um, so the final toy, he's, he's just wearing a tank top underneath it. So oh. he's got these sleeveless <laughs> arms. Uh, and it, the final toy looks better in my opinion. And I, I went hands on with the final toy and, um, it, it, they, they're going to have a, cause I noticed on the box, at least on them, on the photos you took at preview day, they didn't have the names. They just had like LM so, or like, they just had like a code name for all of them. Is that just for spoilers kind of thing? So I was told those are production samples. Uh, okay. Um, so those are production samples. I, I'm hoping that that is something that maybe they address in future runs of these products. Um, so I am told that these were all like straight off the assembly line, like literally the things that are amassing in warehouses and getting ready to be shipped out into retailers right now. Um, well, so I- they are all final production toys. Um, so yeah, no, that, that was probably the one thing I noticed as well is they didn't have the names of the characters on the back of the box, which definitely is useful because no parent is going to remember, I want FMM04. <laughs> And, it, you know, it's going to be a lot easier to say, I want Dinosaur Trainer Owen, or I want, you know, Claire with the Stegosaurus. Yeah. I, I, I like the mercenary. I mean, it, 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 it. I hope they get fun names, you know, like we get a, like what, I mean, can you imagine a Jaws Jackson, uh, yeah, a Jaws yeah. Jackson homage? Or, I mean, like I, I had that, I mean, I'm just having that thought right now that like, I mean, maybe an IMDb, they already list like mercenary one, mercenary two, but it would be almost funny in the credits if just some unnamed, mer- like some of these like mercenary, like the guy in the Fallen Kingdom trailer who gets taken out by the Indoraptor. It's like, what if like in the credits you see his name is like Jaws Jackson is just like a, <laughs> as like a, as a Easter egg, you know, but. It, exactly. Um, no, I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, I think like Colin Trevorrow named a lot of like the key featured extras in Jurassic World. So I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of the key featured extras that like are getting mercenary toys are um or like prominent supporting roles or whatever. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if they have names. I I do hope that Mattel names them because there are quite a few mercenaries in the toy line. I mean, I at least see two nameless two nameless mercenaries in the Entertainment Weekly picture. Yeah. So I, I do hope that they name them because you can't really be like mercenary with Capture Claw and Ankylosaurus or mercenary <laughs> with Stun Rod. I mean, you can. But it's not as fun as like, yeah, like, Jaws Jackson or like, um, you know, what is the, there was like Skinner. Yeah. There's a Skinner guy. Skinner and, Doc, and Dr. Snare. Oh yeah. Dr. Snare. Like those names were just so pulpy that, but I almost think that they, they, they could fit with very Fallen Kingdom. They were very much nineties. No, <laughs> they were very much nineties. Um, oh, I was going to, I, I was going to ask actually just. So I and I think some people noticed it, but so there's there's a Zia figure, but there's no Franklin figure yet. I don't I don't know. Did you end up talking to anybody about I, that or? So uh, not at the Universal event, a toy fair. I brought up both Franklin and uh, Malcolm from Fallen Kingdom, and um, the person was pretty candid. In he said he wasn't exactly sure about the human figures. He said that he knows that not everything has been shown off, um, not everything has been announced. And they've recently, they recently apparently made a push to get even more human figures into the toy line. Um, so he said, stay tuned about those, but it wasn't like a stay tuned and you'll see it was more like stay, stay tuned. Like, cause I'm not entirely certain right now. <laughs> I hope, I hope. Um, but, uh, I imagine with the diversity of the toy line so far, you know, we have quite a few Claire toys. We have Zia, we have Maisie, the little girl. Yes. I was going to, that was the other thing I was going to ask you. Cause it, I heard we got, a few named a few of the characters named in Fallen Kingdom officially over the weekend. Yes, uh, I mean so that's from the Lego event, but I might as well say it now. Um, Maisie's name, the little girl, her name is Maisie Lockwood. Um, so she's related to James Cromwell's character, who plays Benjamin Lockwood. Benjamin Lockwood is John Hammond's old partner who made Jurassic Park with him, and. Uh, he is the one, you know, there's Lockwood's estate. Yeah. It's that big mansion that we've seen from the trailers and in the toys. Um, so I'm very curious to see what type of role she plays and what her importance is into the story. Yeah. Um, but we do know that she is uh, Lockwood's, I would assume, granddaughter. Yeah. I mean, I'm a, <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I'm a, yeah, I think it would be safe to assume granddaughter. Uh, it's, uh, I don't know. I had this weird feeling weird i mean obviously i think the trailer for the first trailer for fallen kingdom kind of dispelled this 
thing that I was like kind of weirdly thinking was going to happen. But like part of me, because she has red hair, I was like, is this Claire's daughter? And it's like years later and Claire and uh, Claire and Owen had a kid or something. And, you know, it is kind of, it is kind of funny because like, you know, when they put out the first image of just this girl looking at these dinosaur displays um, from behind red hair and they hadn't talked about the movie yet. Like you didn't know what type of time jump there was going to be or like what state the characters in the world was going to be. It, it was definitely an understandable thing, especially because Claire's red hair was so prominent in uh, Jurassic World. Yeah. So, so um, is the um, is the and may, forgive me if I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but is the is the Lockwood figure or is yeah is macy does she come with that t-rex skull like the museum yeah, she she comes with that uh, that t-rex museum display skull um as well as a little thing underneath it that holds it and then the little um t-rex like the little miniature t-rex toy which is a toy of a toy because in the movie she's holding a t-rex toy oh so it's a god. little meta there oh my so god it's a little meta there that yeah. that's the equivalent of the the stormtrooper toy the, the stormtrooper <laughs> doll in rogue one exactly exactly um now, this, this toy is a little oversized that she comes with. Um, so if you wanted to play it as a baby T-Rex or something like that, you totally can. <laughs> but uh, it, it's actually a toy of a toy, which I find kind of fun. No, that's really cool. I didn't realize because I was looking at the picture and I was just like, oh, it's just like a baby T-Rex. But uh, I so yeah, yeah. I remember from the, the trailer uh, or the was it in the behind the scenes trailer that they show her holding the toy? Uh, yeah, it was the behind the scenes trailer. Yeah. Cool. Um, so with the attack packs, I do want to address the elephant in the room because a lot of people are commenting like, oh my God, are all these dinosaurs in Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom? <laughs> um, no, no, they are not all in Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom. Could you imagine? Uh, the Herrerasaurus is not in Fallen Kingdom. The Dilophosaurus is not in Fallen Kingdom. Um, it, <sighs> oh, well. I, there are a few other dinosaurs that are definitely not in Fallen Kingdom. Basically, you know the Fallen Kingdom dinosaurs. From the first two trailers and the uh, the Snapchat behind the scenes featurette, like th- those are the Fallen Kingdom dinosaurs, and there's quite a few of them if you pay attention. Yeah, I was gonna say. Um, I mean, this is definitely the most dinosaurs in any Jurassic Park movie. I, I yes. mean, just just not even like you know. You, I mean, we could sit and do the numbers, but I just feel like I mean, maybe Lost World is second in terms of like actual on-screen appearances. Cause that, that was my weird thing with Jurassic world sometimes, or the more I think about it, it's like we didn't see as much as almost you could imagine there being in Jurassic world. And now with fallen kingdom, like, Oh, that there were Carnotauruses running around and there were, you know, there were, exactly. um, uh, what was the Ceratopsian again? Sinos. <laughs> okay. So that's kind of funny. Cause that's something that there was a lot of debate about because there was a leaked size chart that came out. And uh, it said Pachyrhinosaurus. And you couldn't see the front of the skull, so you couldn't tell if there was a horn, so it was pretty easy to accept. Uh, and then the trailer came out. And you see you have a dinosaur with a frill that is clearly not the Pachyrhinosaurus's frill. And, uh, and it's got a long horn on the front of yeah. it, sort of like a Styracosaurus or something like that. And everyone's like, well, that's clearly not a Pachyrhinosaurus. Um, yeah, I guess it started as a Pachyrhinosaurus. And um, eventually the design changed, but the name didn't. Um, but it eventually did change within like the past few months. Uh, this is something I was able to talk to like, you know, some of the toy people about, um, and the dinosaur is a Cynoceratops. Cool. But that, yeah, that's, but yeah, looking at these toy lines, I mean, there's just so many dinosaurs. The idea that like all of them would be in the movie, I mean, is, I mean, yeah, there's already so, I mean, just even from that, um, you know, from the shots in the trailer of all the animals stampeding, it's just like there's such a wealth of dinosaurs that. Uh, and I'm surprised at how many carnivores we're getting in the movie. A lot of carnivores, a lot of carnivores, and that's the other interesting thing is the Metricanthosaurus, the toy of that that is based off a design that uh, in a dinosaur that was cut from the film. That's crazy. Well, I, um, I think we were talking about it before because, like, I mean, from my memory, Metricanthosaurus has been part of this sort of Jurassic Park. The dra- canon mm-hmm. for such a long time of like it, it is it is on the side of an embryo in the in um jurassic park jurassic park yeah oh yeah yeah i'm looking up the picture now like when when nedry is uh stealing the embryos and he steals a stegosaurus misspelled uh <laughs> yeah and then the metricanthosaurus and it's always that name almost more than the dinosaur itself i feel like has always captured my imagination of like 
and like, and yeah, it? like we were. Wh- chatting where is it on the island? What does it look like? Yeah, and and the fact that like now we're actually getting a toy of that. I don't know. That feels like a very. You know, I feel like a big conversation, at least I feel like I have with people about Jurassic Park is that or about Jurassic World is that in, in Fallen Kingdom is like, you know, this I we want the, the Marvel story group. We want the uh, Star Wars uh, canon kind of thing. And I don't know, just even making a toy of this Metricanthosaurus is such a cool well, thing. Especially when you realize that it's based off of film design that, um yeah, yeah, the film isn't going to show off the design. And if a future film does it, they might not necessarily stick to their earlier design. Um, but th- this is very much based off of a film design that did not make the cut. And I think that's one of the few toys I know of in the franchise, other than maybe the Stegoceratops, oh, yeah. that weird thing. Um, I think it might be one of the few toys I know that's based off of a cut design, um, which I, I find very fascinating. Yeah, that is. That's. Um, I never actually thought of it that way. That yeah, because like. I mean, I doubt there was ever going to be a Quetzalcoatlus in the original Jurassic exactly. Park movie, or, or um, uh, the Coelophysis figures, or exactly. you know, yeah, it, yeah, that makes sense. Um, and and then, before before people's imaginations get get ahead of themselves, uh, that doesn't. I think that might be the only toy in this toy line that's from a cut design. I d- don't look at all these other toys and be like, man, we almost had a Herrerasaurus. And a or, mini, you know, like, yeah. The, ex- exactly. So, and speaking of when you're talking about building an expanded universe there, um, that is something that I asked about the dinosaurs like Herrerasaurus. Well, the first thing I asked is I said, this looks a lot like Jurassic Park the Games dinosaur design. Is that purposeful? And uh, the answer is yes, it is very much purposeful. Oh, that's they, so really cool. to, they really wanted to look into the expanded lore and um, see if they're making... They wanted to expand their dinosaur toy line into a lot of different directions. So the first thing they wanted to do is figure out what dinosaurs lived on the islands, um, what dinosaurs existed that we know in the lore. And oftentimes then, if there was just room for a unique dinosaur, could they fit it in? Um, So the Rarasaurus, when they decided that might be a cool dinosaur to do, they went and saw that, hey, this game did it. So they really pulled from that design design and paid homage to that design um does that necessarily mean the game is canon no that's up for you to decide (laughs) but you can decide that you can say essentially what they said is if there's a toy of it uh that doesn't mean you're going to ever see it in the movies that doesn't mean it was on isla nublar it doesn't mean it was on isla sorna it doesn't mean it's there during jurassic world or jurassic park it's undefined but what you can know is it existed in that world at some point in time in this great greater expanded universe um, they're not exactly saying, you know, oh, if you see it, then it's on Isla Nublar during Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom. No, 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 no. But it is a toy from the expanded universe, from an expansive time, an expansive set of areas, uh, and it does exist in the universe somewhere, or it at least did at some point in time. Yeah. Um, and that and that goes with um, a lot of the other dinosaurs, like the Dilophosaurus, um, obviously. Yeah. Uh, a fun little note with the Dilophosaurus the one that's in the traditional, like the, in the packaging, um, with sort of the red frill and the red crests on its head, that is based off of a, the color scheme is based off of a statue on display in Lockwood Manor. Oh, cool. Um, and then there was another Dilophosaurus, and people thought, oh, one was the prototype, one was different. Um, no, the thing is, there's going to be two packs as well of the attack packs, and they're going to have exclusive paint decals. So the sort of blue looking Dilophosaurus with a little bit more of a classic looking frill um, is part of one of the exclusive ones, the exclusive repaint. Um, And that's why there are two Dimorphodons as well. Yeah, I noticed that. Yeah, I I didn't realize that the I don't think I knew the that there would be these two packs because I I love the idea of the color variants. That's that's such a cool I mean, it's it's you know, it's another way for us to to buy stuff, but it's just it's just kind of a little more. Thought put into it adds it. diversity to the toy line. The Jurassic franchise is known for diff- um, variations of color on these different species. So maybe you can presume one's a male and one's a female, or however you'd like to build your head cannon. They're not defining that, um, and they would probably argue that they're all female, at least at this point in time. But, uh, you know, it's up for your imagination and play factor to really take form, because I think a lot of these animals, except for those that are explicitly said you can presume are slightly undefined. Um, you know, blue is a she, the Indoraptor is a he. Yes, that's so, so that was confirmed 
this weekend, right? I, I don't yes. believe I heard that before this. And this was correct. Yeah. Was this at that the preview day or the or Mattel or um both? T- okay, both. cool. Um, re- reps were sharing that information at both places, so it is a he. Um, they're pegging it as like the first male dinosaur in the Jurassic World films. I'm not entirely certain if that's entirely accurate, to be honest, because um, if you assume from the movies, there's a lot of ground to assume that male parasaurolophuses are sort of an orangish yellow color and the females are green. Yeah. Um, and it was an orangish yellow parasaurolophus in uh, Jurassic World. So I would say, hey, those, those were males. Um, also, I would assume that after trying to make all the dinosaurs female to in act population control absolutely did not work out <laughs> no no it certainly i would did not. assume that they would take a more simplistic and practical approach to population control just like sort of getting your pet fixed or something like that i assume that they probably waited to the animals hit maturity and then physically took care of that oh they neutered all the dinosaurs that's so Ye- so sad uh, that that's not canon that's just <laughs> me sort of taking a guess um no i mean i it's funny to even i don't know it's just something that i even just I've never thought of that until right or like I don't know yeah because I yeah I think Jurassic World is a lot more sophisticated and it's and they're like well we can just neuter I I almost imagine Wu thought that that originally making them all female was a very elegant solution exactly very elegant but overly complex a lot oftentimes the more simple the solution the better the results and he went to he tried to play god rather than just kind of just kind of brute force in it yeah and, um it, you know it, it it that's sort of the theme of the franchise is like the more control you try to assert the more it's going to turn around and bite you yeah and um so yeah no i mean that's just sort of me speculating there um based off some of the evidence that's been presented in the films as well well and, so and a different that's a different discussion a different y- podcast yeah yeah there. yeah <laughs> but i mean yeah i mean yeah jurassic world probably has more resources to do that sort of thing too so but Exactly. I think it just makes sense. I think that is probably the most simplistic form of population control that is actually proven to work and will work. And the dinosaurs aren't going to start breeding on their own um, if you enact that. Yeah. Um, Which would also leave um, a little leeway for some of the younger dinosaurs in Jurassic World um, at the, you know, any of the juveniles at the Gentle Giants Petting Zoo or anything that just wasn't fully developed yet. They might not have been neutered. Oh, yeah. And in that case, they might have grown up and there still might be breeding dinosaurs in Jurassic World because it's four years later now. So I, I, I sort of like that because it gives you a little bit of room like, oh, they're being really smart about it. But then the disaster happened and we have breeding dinosaurs again. So in my head, I love that. I love that explanation. No, because I, it gives room for growth in the universe and makes sense. Yeah, that that when I mean, because from the Dinosaur Protection Group website, we know that some species are extinct. Spinosaurus, R.I.P. Um, I, I noticed that was like a very, very specific choice to me that felt like almost kind of a call out to the fans, but, uh, um, yeah, but I like that idea that, yeah, that there's that four years later, it's, it's not just going to be the same dinosaurs we saw in the first movie. It's there, there's going to be all exactly. these exactly. And you know, there, there's a little bit of debate about online about like where those dinosaurs come from. And I, this is actually something I wanted to ask about, but I didn't ask about, I don't think the movie's going to explicitly answer it, but honestly, you know, maybe the Indominus Rex wasn't the new only new attraction. You know, maybe she was the headlining attraction of a brand new expansion, and they had a Carnotaur. You know, they had multiple Carnotauruses and Allosauruses and Cynoceratops already in their d- displays, but they weren't public. Like the public couldn't couldn't see them yet, so they weren't announced. Nobody knew that Jurassic World had this whole range of new dinosaurs ready to come out like a, in a year. It was just sort of, you know, an expansion pack for their island yeah, well, waiting to happen. And then the park fell apart and <laughs> these dinosaurs became integrated into the wild. Yeah, well, I mean, it's it's funny that you say it in that way because uh, a big thing, like when I go to the San Diego Zoo, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of going there and, and their wildlife preserve and everything and the safari park. And a big thing that they talk about is that the animals that you see on display are merely a small fraction of the actual animals that they have um, exactly. sort of offsite you know ones that are for breeding programs ones to be put back in the wild older animals that can't necessarily uh you know survive on their own but the animals that you actually see on display are really just kind of the the megafauna the show animals but Mm -hmm. really that there's actually 
way that there's way more animals that are that you don't see and so i kind of like that as a it's, real world analog exactly those all could have been new dinosaurs as well if they were studying and making sure they're stable and ready to be integrated into the park as well yeah before they um, put so, them on display in front of people mm-hmm. exactly so i think that that's where all the new species came from i think they're simply part of the island that weren't part of public exhibits yet but they were definitely part of uh jurassic world engines and Zerani global's larger sort of uh plan plan yeah and, yeah um i um, i had a quick question about the because this is what i was curious about so there's those two story packs that okay. um, that were at um preview day are those characters the same size as the regular figures yes story packs in fact everything is like pretty much the same size so like even like the rc cars they are scaled to the three and wow. three quarter inch humans and you can put your humans in the three and three in the rc cars and everything like that um, so, yeah, the story packs, they are the same size. Um, so it was Owen and Blue and um, Claire in a gyrosphere. Yeah. And those are based off of key moments of the film. Um, if you notice, the gyrosphere has damage on it. Um, I'm oh. pretty sure that moment is from when their gyrosphere takes a top onto the water. Yeah. <laughs> um, and Owen and Blue, I mean, obviously, Owen and Blue is a moment in the movie. I think... I think I saw that Blue has a jumping mechanism, like that version of Blue. Oh, cool. Like you push down on her and she sort of jumps. That's um, cool. Oh, yeah, I yeah. Really preferred, I preferred her sculpt and her paint job over the attack pack one. The only issue is is to make that jumping mechanism work, her feet are slightly oversized. <laughs> um, and that, that is something I guess I'll note right now. I like the toys. I love the toys, actually. But I don't. I did not fall in love with any of the Velociraptors yet. That doesn't mean I dislike the Velociraptors. I just haven't found one that I'm like, yes, that is the definitive Jurassic Park Velociraptor. And quite a few of the rest of the Mattel toys, I'm like, those. That's the new definitive definitive version of that toy. Oh, I mean, um, Carnotaurus. That, that yes, hands that is down is in- the definitive incredible. One hundred percent. I cannot get over how good the sculpt detail is. The paint detail, the play feature is really nice because it doesn't get in the way of the toy, but it gives you a really good play pattern. Um, yeah, no, I, I, I absolutely love it. Kids are going to lose their minds. And it's only $20, and it's big, man. That's cool. Um, That's dope. It, it, it's big. Um, when I originally saw these, like I assumed that that was about the size of like the 2011 Dino Showdown, like Allosaurus, but it's bigger than that. Oh, wow. Um, in fact, the Roar of War is coming a little bit closer to the 2011 Dino Showdown Allosaurus, believe it or not. Oh, cool. Um, yeah, so, like, these toys are bigger than you think. Um, oh, I'm so excited. Except for the attack packs, which are small. Yeah. But not miniature. There's, you know, reasonably sized. I mean, the for, for listeners, if you haven't checked out the Jurassic Outpost, like, photo albums yet, there's so many great close-ups of this Carnotaurus where, like, it's a toy, <laughs> but it just has so much personality. Like, it's got such an interesting yes. face. And the... I don't know, it just... It, 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 I think that was a problem with some of the Jurassic World toys was that they were dinosaur, just very like generic. And it, it's not about necessarily like how we were talking about Jurassic Park 3 where you have to put them in crazy poses. But it's just there's some subtle ways in which like in looking at the Carnotaurus or even the Baryonyx, like Baryonyx uh, or the Allosaurus, like there's just certain ways that the, the skin like lifts up from the teeth or the ways that the eyes are pointed that really kind of like... There was a lot of care that went into their sculpts to make them look like the dinosaurs from the movie and make them look like Jurassic Park dinosaurs and make them present really well as a toy. Um, I mean, it's just the amount of detail that are in these toys and the amount of articulation, um, like even going down to the attack packs, like I think they have like ball jointed shoulders um, and their hips swivel out a bit. Wow. Um, and, and, you know, not only do you get the up and down motion, but you get an out, outward motion. You can open and close the jaws, and um, you can really customize and control the toys uh, to pose them in a way that you like. And I really, really appreciate that. Uh, it adds a really good play um, factor to the toys, so when kids are playing with them, they can do. And it adds a really good display factor, and um, they are very aesthetically pleasing. Yeah, no, I mean, even that little setup at the toy, the toy fair with, like, the... It just makes you want to have a full display of, like, to make a diorama to set these up in because they're so... They're so... Uh, mm-hmm. They're so cool looking. Uh, but So, I think another one that we want to talk about is the Indoraptor. I mean, that is a super articulated toy, incredibly detailed. Um, it's, it's a larger toy, and it's only 20 bucks, which is nuts. Yeah. Um, it sort of feels... <laughs> It sort of feels like a NECA toy, um, except for not brittle. 
Yeah. Uh, NECA <laughs> toys are super brittle, and this yeah. one feels like it's made out of actually nice plastic that is durable. But uh, yeah, you can pose it however you like, and it looks really good. Um, I, I can see and, I can see a lot of people when they get the Indoraptor, like because its arms and then its hands are on joints that you can I can see this thing getting giving uh, characters hugs, you know. <laughs> um, it's really funny because uh, at Toy Fair they sort of had it where its arm was reaching out um, uh, at the one event, um, and there are two. There are two Indoraptors. That's what this that's what I was going to ask. Out, yeah, this is the one that's coming out in the spring, the superposable one, and then there's the electronic one, which is also fairly articulated. Um, it's the exact same size. The only thing different is it features a slightly nicer head sculpt, um, and. Um, it's thirty four ninety nine. It's coming out in the fall, and it has electronics and roars. And you press a button, its arms sort of do an attack. So it has a little bit more of like a play feature like that. Or no, maybe it wasn't its arms. Maybe it was its head. Or maybe it was both. I have a video of it, so I'll oh, have cool. to go back and look. Um, um, yeah, that was my question too. So there. So what what you saw it at the Universal preview and at the Toy Fair. So this is a mix of quote unquote wave one, wave two kind of thing. It, Universal preview was pretty much all wave one. Um, I think the exception of that is the Herrerasaurus and Stigamolic. Um, cause if you, even if you notice on their packaging, like their packaging says new. No. So I think that might be wave two. Now, whether or not that's an actual fall wave or just like a mid, like a, like a few months later, like a little bit of a wave refresh, I'm not entirely certain. Like they might still be part of their, um, spring push, their spring and summer push, but like, you know, the Dilophosaurus and Velociraptors might be coming, like, you know, in April 16th when the toys release, and maybe, like, the Rarosaurus and uh, Stigamolic might not be out until June. Okay. Uh, oh, interesting. Um, uh, yeah, I'm so excited because uh, these toys come out a day before my birthday, so I feel like I know where I'm going to be <laughs> nice. at night. Oh, yeah, <laughs> exactly. I really wonder, this toy line is so big and comprehensive, I really do wonder if they're going to try to do, like, a... Uh, it doesn't have the following of Star Wars, but I do wonder if they'll try to do like a midnight release somewhere. Um, maybe like, you know, I don't think Toys R Us would do it, but like Walmart or something, even some, something that's 24 hours kind of get out there on the shelves once they're out there. Is there any exclusives mentioned at this point? Yes, there are a lot of exclusives. They weren't really ready to talk too many details. Um, battle da- the battle damage assortment which is basically like imagine them sort of like the attack pack size, but slightly more deluxe in terms of features and um, paint job. They will be nine ninety nine, and they have removable, not removable, but they have like slidable bat- battle damage. Oh, wow. And um, that's going to be nine ninety nine. I believe that's exclusive to Toy Fair. Uh, I'm Toy Fair, geez. <laughs> um, Walmart. Walmart. Um. Um, and uh, then there's a line called Destructosaurs, which are ex- exclusive to Toys R Us. And uh, their name sounds like a gimmicky toy. They're not. They are, once again, they're scaled with the entire toy line. They're dinosaurs that come with human equipment. So, like, imagine, like, a cage, um, which is destroyable. Oh, cool. Um, so, like, one of the dinosaurs in that line is Dimetrodon. Another one is a Pteranodon in helicopter. The helicopter, like, the cockpit can rip off of it. Oh, and uh, so th- they're full size. So, like, that's a helicopter that you can fit a three and three quarter inch human figure into. Um, wow. So, yeah, no, there's some really cool exclusives coming. Uh, I, I don't know all of them, and I, I imagine there's some surprises there as well. That's really cool. I mean, again, like, the idea that they that they released, that they kicked this whole thing off with, and, and I guess when you were at the Toy Fair this weekend, did you get the sense that there was, like, oh, also going on right now, well, you're playing with these toys you're taking photos you're checking everything out that entertainment weekly is also doing the simultaneous push like did you get a sense from the people working there that there was kind of this like making it an event versus just oh hey, oh yeah the absolutely they, they wanted to make it an event for the fans they absolutely wanted the fans to have just to wake up on friday and just basically be surprised um by everything and just kind of have a big surprise there waiting for them like a big reveal um, and it, I think it absolutely worked. I think that it was a really, really good, um, method of doing everything. And, uh, yeah, no, and honestly, the, the genuine passion and knowledge about the products and the past products from the universal team was, uh, I think really, really surprising and really, um, really humbling in a lot of ways. 
Uh, I think everyone was so super excited. There are like there are some really cool things like on the the package art designer, and I'm so sorry if you're listening to this. I forget your name. I met so many people over the weekend, but um, he put a lot of work into basically paying paying homage to the classic Jurassic Park packaging. So like the volcanic um colors in the background and the jungle silhouette is a bit an homage to the classic sunset look. Oh, so um, cool. And then, you know, it's about modernizing it and incorporating it with the themes of Fallen Kingdom. So there's the volcanic art and there's the cage art. But he really wanted to find what did people like about Jurassic Park packaging art and integrate it and also make it present really well. Um, so there's an Easter egg on the back of the packaging. I haven't talked about this yet. Ooh. But, um, on the back of the packaging, when you flip it over and there's like a picture of the dinosaur and it's sort of like in a bluish holographic display there's some numbers running down like the left and right side, like just sort of like making it look like it's sort of in a computer display. Uh, one of the set of numbers is the release date of Jurassic Park. And another set of the numbers is the release date of Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom. Wow. And uh, just a lot of care and love went into all of it. And uh, I was able to have just some really candid conversations about like, oh, you know, like everyone really like it wasn't you didn't go in like, oh, yeah, this about Ken or no. It was like, yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, we talked about, like, the Jurassic World mark on the side, the Jurassic Park mark on the side of the legs of the classic Jurassic Park toys, and um, why Kenner did that, and um, and why why they opted for a different approach, which yeah, I yeah. think is a really, really nice approach. Yeah, you were, uh, I think I saw that conversation on Twitter, but, so they're not, there's no JW on the hip, it's, it's now there's a mark on the... A, a small little engraved um, T-Rex skull inside of a circle underneath the foot. Or if it's an item that the foot is too small, like the Dimetrodon, like it was underneath its wing. Oh, yeah, I can see that here. That's, uh, I um, mean, yeah, I mean, at this point, it, it's just... It's subtle. It's classy. It still gives you your... Um, it still gives you your mark of Jurassic Park, your emblem, um, so you know it's an official toy. But it, it doesn't take away from the artistry of the toy itself. Um, so you can just have a dinosaur on display on your desk, and you, it doesn't have this big stamp on the leg that sort of <laughs> says, I'm a toy! Yeah. Um, well, I think as a yeah. kid, I, I am having like a recovered memory here, but I... I feel like as a t- as a kid, even though it wasn't in the Jurassic Park movies, I feel like with all my Jurassic Park toys, I feel like in a sense I was like, oh, they were br- like the, in my head, like <laughs> weird headcanon. The dinosaurs were all branded in the toy it's world. It's funny that you say this. It's funny that you say this because in the movie, they they almost were branded in the movie. And that's where that's also where that came from. Oh, shit. They were, they were going to have branding on the sides of their legs. Um, yeah. And that is sort of where it came from. I'm not sure if it was getting exactly look like that mark in JP, but there was going to be some sort of like trademark branding on the size of the dinosaur's leg for engine to own them and i think spielberg eventually did away from it because although he wanted a parable to di- animal abuse and kind of be like hey these animals should be set free i think he felt like that one pushed it a little too far um but uh kenner still stuck with that on their legs because their worry was hey there are a lot of dinosaur toys on the market how do we show people that a jurassic park toy is a jurassic park toy now, honestly it probably wasn't necessary because they were pushing a level of quality in an art style that this really wasn't being done then and hasn't been done until now with Mattel. Um, and I think that Mattel really had the confidence and Universal really had the confidence that these toys look great. It's clear clear that they're Jurassic Park toys and you do not need to throw a logo on the side of their legs to say it. I think that they you can tell immediately looking at them that's a Jurassic Park toy. No, yeah, I think that's that's really cool. And yeah, just like you're saying, she's another sign of confidence from Universal with uh, with Mattel and their brand. Um yeah, that's so. Yeah, that's really cool. I, I'm noticing a few other like I'm looking at some of the comments that I answered answered on Twitter, and I just kind of wanted to make sure I um, got into it uh, in this. So like the Mosasaurus is huge. It's made of like a real feel sort of. They say real feel. It's not like the classic real feel toys. It's almost sort of like a hard rubber or a soft plastic, and it's hollow. It's a weighty toy because of the size of it, but it's light for the size as well. But it doesn't feel cheap. It uh, has articulated fins and an articulated jaw. Oh, cool. And it's really great because it wasn't built to... They didn't, like... It, they're not going to advertise it as play in the bath with this, but they play tested it for, like... Kids are obviously gonna, going to want to bring that into the bath. What? And it absolutely... It absolutely... It's been play tested in the water. Oh, that's so um, cool. Uh, again, they're not going to advertise it. And I'm sure if you do a lot of water play, it might degrade. I don't know. But they did plenty of play, t- play testing in the water yeah. to make sure it's safe and will make sense in there. Now, people were bringing up that the, the toy was huge, I maybe like two and a half feet long. 
I mean, it was absolutely wonderful. I cannot, that is one I'm going to buy and I don't know where I'm going to put it, but I'm going to put it somewhere. <laughs> you could just, um, leave, leave, you could just like when you make your bed, you can just kind of leave it on your bed as like a display piece. And then like, obviously, right. <laughs> well, I mean, I guess you could sleep with it at night. I mean, no, no, no yeah, judgments, yeah, yeah. It's you know, real feel hug it, you know, um, <laughs> old mosey know, keeps you company at night. You know, it's whatever floats your boat or, um, doesn't, I guess. Or, yeah, it doesn't. That swims underneath your boat. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what that means, but, um, you know, so, uh, so, you yeah, know, it was a really, really great toy. Huge. It's in scale with the rest of the toy line. I Shit. mean, it, it, it could eat the T-Rex, uh, the big T-Rex if you wanted to. Um, I mean, it doesn't have a hollow belly, so it couldn't, but the size of it implies it could. Um, so people notice that the packaging wasn't as big as the toy. Uh, that's because the tail is a one-time assembly piece. So mm. essentially the tail is separate inside the packaging. And then once you open it, you attach it and it adds another like foot and a half to the length. Um, and the flippers might be the same. I'm not entirely certain, but th- that is something that a lot of the toys are doing to reduce the packaging size. The tails are removable. That's even with the roar of horse. Um, oh, wow. I-, I don't think you can remove them once you assemble them, but you do have to assemble the tails, uh, from the packaging. Cause if you look at the packaging, if you look at the toys that are in the box, you'll notice that like sort of you don't see the back end of them and you can't see the toys. Well, they opted not to make a soft plastic tail that it, they bend in the package because it, it will never lose that bend in the plastic, no matter what you do to it. Yeah. I mean, so, so many, often some, just, yeah. So many collectors are like, you know, if they f- happen to find a red Rex or something, it's like the tails all crooked and exactly. So you're not going to get that. Um, so these tails are removable. That also works wonderf- wonderfully for, um, fans of all ages because that means re- retailers are going to be able to put more items on the shelves. Um, they're going to be able to display more items, stock more items just because the boxes are a little bit smaller. Um, so it keeps retailers happy. And while you might think, Oh, what does that mean to me? Well, that means if they're happy, they're buying more product. You're going to get more product. Mattel is going to be able to make more toys. Kids are going to be happier, etc. So, so cool. Um, the Thrash and Throw T-Rex was amazing. It's electronic. Oh, wow. Um, it has, so you can, it has stomping noises. It has a bunch of different roars. Um, it's articulated. You can pose it. Its hips swivel in and out. Its legs go in and out. Its feet swivel in and out. Um, its arms are, artic- you can do a lot with it. Um, it also has an amazing play mechanism where um, you can just buy the tail. You can thrash it up and down. You can make its mouth close. Um you can sort of do a mix of them with the tail, and then you can do this really good snapping motion where it snaps down to the ground in front of it and then picks up. And you literally don't have to get the toy, and, like, you can literally hold the toy on the desk and have, like, Owen standing up, and you can have the toy lunge for Owen, literally grab him, thrash him around, and then throw him. Oh, that's um, cool. And the play feature is super smooth. It's super solid feeling. Um, and it just looks really, really good. I was super, I was so impressed by it. Um Th- that is going to blow kids' minds. I wish that was a toy when I was a kid. Yeah. I mean, um, I mean, any of these toys, the I'd be happy sculpt, with, with. And the head I... sculpt is Jurassic Park. I mean, it's like the Jurassic Park T-Rex. Um, for the first time, I think we're actually getting like a real Jurassic Park T-Rex head sculpt on one of these toys, which is really cool. It's, I mean, I'm looking at your photos, the close-ups. It's just, it's, you know, I think part of me is almost more excited for a lot of the new stuff. But, I mean, this Rex is it, really impressive. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, I really liked it. And then there was, of course, the Colossal T-Rex, I think it was called, which is, like, slightly over three feet long. It's huge. Um, it's it's not heavy, like, you can't hold it, but it's definitely not light. Oh, jeez. Um, it, it, it looks great. I mean, it's not, like, a kid's still going to be able to play with it, but they're not going to be able to, like, throw it 20 feet. Like, it's, like, a super cheap, super, like, uh, like it's not a super value toy in terms of the quality but it is a super value to work in terms of the price. For fifty four ninety nine, you're getting this three foot long T Rex with articulation, um, which can swallow figures, just like the old bull T Rex. Yes. And then it has a hatch on the belly where you, then you can remove the figure. Um, it, it's a really really cool play feature. It's a whole lot of fun. It looks really good. Um, is and, is that the most expensive toy in the line? Um, it's probably the most expensive I saw. There might be. Um, similarly priced items in the future, but like the Thrash and Throw T Rex is forty, the Mosasaurus is thirty, um, 
Yeah, it's certainly the most expensive that I saw. Uh, the Tyranna drone is probably more money. I don't oh. remember what the price of that is, but that's we're not we're not really counting that as like a main action figure, even though it is still once again scaled with the action figures. Believe it or not. Wow. Um. So, but yeah, that toy is really really cool. Um, there are the lights and sounds vehicles. So there's the submarine. Again, you can put human figures inside of it, completely scaled with a bunch of like moving parts. Um, these like kind of moving arms. You can play with it however you like. You press the button, it makes some sounds. It's uh, dome lights up blue, like sort of like a deep sea submarine. Hmm. The uh, the other vehicle, I think they call it like the dinosaur tracking rig or something like that. Yeah, it's, uh, let's see, I'm trying to see. Oh, oh, that picture, I can't see the close-up of it. But yeah, it's something like, what? There was a couple, there was a couple of vehicles, right? Not just the submarine. Uh, the, there were a couple of vehicles, but the electronic one, um, it is the off-road rescue rig. And then so you press its button. It has two doors that open on the either side of like sort of the truck head. And you can put figures inside of it on both sides. And then it's got this like kind of big flat, um, this sort of flat bed empty thing. And it looks like there might even be a piece of gear that comes out of the side of it. So that you can maybe strap over top of a dinosaur on the back of it. Oh, cool. Um, and uh, you press the button. Its headlights light up. And it makes sort of like a, an idling slash car noise like a big truck noise so it's kind of got that type of noise cool um and then there was the gyrosphere blast vehicle which looks like this really cool heavy armored um like military vehicle you can put a dinosaur in the back of the um truck which you saw at toy fair they had the allosaurus inside of it yeah but uh you press a button and a gyrosphere like the front of the truck literally launches downward and a gyrosphere launches out of it so you can make a uh quick getaway um <laughs> if a dinosaur is attacking you or you can a attack like you can attack like you can send launch your gyrosphere to knock down a dinosaur which we got a video of us knocking down the um metricanthosaurus yeah that's um, cool and so on and so forth i think that that gyrosphere is the one gyrosphere that only seats one. Oh, one seater um, so it's a one-seater. It's like a smaller gyrosphere, I think. I don't think it was a two-seater. It might have been. I need to go through and look at my um, images again. But I think it was a one-seater. But all the other gyrospheres are two-seaters. But that's a really cool uh, It's a really cool feature. It's $29.99. Really nice toy. Competitively priced. Those lights and sounds vehicles are just $20. And they're pretty big, um, which was surprising. Uh, is there a full-size gyrosphere? Is, or is that the like the BB-8 style um, sort of toy? Uh, like, what do you mean? Like, um, like when the BB-8, when you can control it with the app on your phone or whatever, and it's like... Oh, oh. yeah, there, there are two uh, properly sized gyrospheres, so at, at least that I know so far. So there's the story pack, one with Claire, that, sit, that sits two characters. Um, that is 100% the right size, and that's only fourteen ninety nine, and that comes with a human figure, Claire. And, um, but you can put another figure in there if you like. And then, yes, the electronic, uh, the electronic remote control gyrosphere also fits two characters. And it comes with what they call a slug figure, which is like a really basic, um, like Owen action figure. <laughs> slug figure. But you, you, you can pull that really basic Owen out of there and put like your nicer articulated figures in there should you choose. Oh, cool. Um, so you can 100% play with it. There's a bunch of different features. It can spin. Sort of like in Jurassic World when it gets hit by the ankylosaur tail and it sort of spins. You can press a button and it does that spinning motion. It looks really cool. You can screw the top off. You can bring the figures in and out. There's a lot you can do with it. Um, it's really great. I'm looking for the price right now. I cannot find it. I want to say it was 20 but uh, don't quote me on that. Oh, wait. I think um, I can see the... Oh, it's uh, SRP is twenty nine ninety nine. 29 okay and that one is apparently steven spielberg's favorite toy from the assortment <laughs> it's no secret that steven spielberg loves the gyrosphere um it's he's a big theme park guy and he's loved the gyrosphere since the idea came up from jurassic world and kind of keeps pushing it and i know he keeps pushing it to go into the actual theme parks like you know universal studios florida or california or elsewhere yeah um, well i mean after seeing the footage of um 
Bryce Dallas Howard and uh, uh, Justice Smith like on that rig on the gyrosphere. It's like you can so <laughs> imagine there being a roller co- a gyrosphere roller coaster. Yes, yes, exactly. Uh, I think that they would have to expand the seat count, maybe like four seater per thing, and maybe do away with the glass dome because I mean, I, if I'm seeing animatronic dinosaurs, I don't want to see them through a smudgy glass dome. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so I think there's potential there. I, I think that it's something that would be cooler in real life, but in a fictional, like a world where you're seeing fictional things, it, uh, remove the glass, um, because we don't need it. Yeah. Yeah. I can, uh, yeah, I, to- uh, I, I can totally see why. Well, and yeah, and I just being the universal studios or any of these things like, uh, yeah, those, 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 uh, gyrosphere glass is not going to be crystal clear. Exactly. Um, so that's sort of my appre- that's sort of what's ap- I am apprehensive about that is because it could be really cool, but like I'm just already thinking of the practicality, and I feel like I'd be annoyed by some of like the little nuances that come with it, um, that could just be done away with if you're inside of a regular vehicle. Yeah. Um. Anyways, that's neither here nor there. <laughs> um. So yeah, no, there were a lot of toys. Is there anything that? Oh, I don't think I really talked about. Like the Stegosaurus, you press down its plate, its tail does this really dramatic swinging motion. Again, very nicely detailed, nicely sculpted. That one's not painted like the movie Stegosaurus. It reminds me more of a classic Kenner paint job. Yeah, I can't. I'm trying to find a close up of it. Does it have the beak? Is it? Is there? Is there? Oh, there is a beak. So there's no beak yes. gate problem. Uh, uh, not not with the toy in the movie. I don't think they have a beak. But okay. um, thankfully, they they did make a beak on the toy. Um, <laughs> Um, and there's, I mean, I don't know. I don't know what's going on with those Jurassic World Stegosaurs. Like they, they had proper DNA, and then they just messed up. Yeah, they took out the 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 uh, bird part of their DNA. Um, and there's a Suchomimus too, which looks super. It almost it almost reminds me of like a Chaos Effect dinosaur because it, the it's neon super garish in the colors. Um, and the the sculpt is very weird. Yeah, no, it, it's a good looking toy. It just doesn't look like it. It looks like it would be from like an animated series um, of Jurassic Park, or like a hybrid dinosaur rather than like an actual actual Suchomimus. Like I, I'm sort of curious about that toy. It looks really good. Yeah, it just doesn't look like a film dot. Like it doesn't really blend in with the rest. So maybe a more accurate paint job on that would. Yeah, I mean a more realistic paint job would kind of pull that toy together. Um, I'm going to be curious to see what that looks like once it finally comes out. Cause that is a fall item. Well, and also, uh, you know, a thing that I, I was talking about a little bit when I did a, just like a little, you know, first reactions kind of thing to these toys. And the thing that I, I, I really uh, appreciate that you took pictures and stuff because it was like the photos then like, and then you kind of backed it up with the, that the entertainment weekly photos aren't necessarily all the finished and final things that like, it, it, I, I feel like the detailing looks a lot better exactly in your photos and like you said in real life these toys really come together whereas to me the photos some of the initial photos looked um you know just it almost looked like the detail wasn't there as much but then when i'm just looking at these photos and the close-ups and stuff it's weird the images that they sent to entertainment weekly they shouldn't know because like even the baryonyx it's like it's a very obvious like hand painted and it's using like these sort of blotchy looking colors and it just doesn't look good and then the final model of the baryonyx is using different colors and it just looks fantastic and it's got these this really nice like sort of like metallic blue paint underneath the eye and on top of the snout and it really pulls it together it just really feels like these sort of shiny scales um and the triceratops looks great there's so much detail on it Metricanthosaurus looks amazing. The Allosaurus looks really good. It's got like this sort of more muted blue and this sort of more muted yellow um, stripes on it. And they really blend together nicely. The little red on the crest. Um, and it's a big toy. Um, well, but yeah, the images they send in Entertainment Weekly, man, I, they're just sort of weird. Um, but I mean, I'm very happy that it's the other way, you know, that it's the other way around. That ex- when we get the, t- when we see the toys in person, we're going to be blown away because of how... Uh, of of how much better they look than the than, than the sort of promos it, it, and stuff. Exactly, I think that that is, um, and I think that obviously some of those photos were early, and I I do believe that what's ultimately going to end up happening is they'll retake some of those photos um, with the proper, uh, like with ro- proper production models. But I mean, you know, it's um, it's it's sort of par for the Jurassic course because wasn't the. Um, in a lot of the promo photos for the for the Jurassic Park toys, weren't they just using a Stan Winston sculpt of a T Rex before they had the um, final? Uh, the yeah, yeah, they they were using a like a modified version of the Stan Winston sculpt. 
sculpt. Yes. So funny. Um, <laughs> you know, it obviously looked great, but I think that was a case of the, the prototype quote unquote looking better. Uh, where most of these, I would say the prototypes look worse yeah. and then the final toy looks better, which is kind of different for toys because most of the time, even other toys, normally like the prototypes are really expertly painted and, um, you know, there's a ton of sculpt detail and then the final production model, like the paint is kind of blotchy and this detail isn't there, but rather like these toys, like through each step of the process, they're becoming more and more detailed and, um, more beautifully painted and the final production toys look great. Yeah, no, from, um, from your photos and just from you talking about it, they seem much more than what I initially expected. I mean, the fact is, like, I, I, I'm not somebody who, I mean, again, I only got, like, three dinosaurs from the Jurassic World line. I almost, I, I, I'm obviously excited to to see all this stuff, but then I was like, oh, what do I actually want to get? And I'm like, oh, I definitely want to get more than I initially thought I was going to. <laughs> yeah, no, wait till you see these in person. They're going to blow your mind cool and then of course you know like the roar of wars they have electronic si- sounds and a biting mechanism or the triceratops its head rears and it makes a roaring noise but they, they just all look so good they sound good um they they're they've got really good play feature really good play pattern um I, i'm super impressed by them that's awesome. uh to say the least um and, uh, so uh i feel like we haven't you know what we haven't talked about the sticky mullock yet Yes, and also I just want to real quick while I remember the Green Raptor. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. She is not in the movie. Um, it is they were basically to avoid giving they they said you know people would have blue fatigue if the only Velociraptor in all these toys was Velociraptor blue. Um, so they wanted to come up with a neutral colored uh, raptor. And they looked at Jurassic World, and they saw that two of the Velociraptors are green, um, and then there's blue, and then there's Echo, and Echo is yellow. But they figured since two of the Velociraptors are green, and they were all custom-made for, like, the Raptor pack to be sort of different, how about maybe the very base Raptor that they are working from was a green Velociraptor? Mm. So they said, you can either assume that maybe this is a member of that pack at an important time, or maybe this was the base genome that... Dr. Wu was working with when creating the Raptor pack from it, like maybe a very base version of the Velociraptor, but this is sort of the neutral base Velociraptor. Again, you can assume it exists in the universe, but it's not necessarily from the movies. But the reason why they went with green was because of, there were two green Raptors in Jurassic World. Um, so they sort of averaged it out and said, well, green makes sense, and that's what they went with. Huh, that's so interesting. They, one, they wanted to make sure it was different than uh, Charlie and Delta as well. Yeah, no, I wouldn't. Um, I wouldn't mistake that Green Raptor for either of them. Yeah, uh, and that's and that is why um and they they handed that down for for a level of consistency. They handed that down, so that's why there's a Green Raptor in the Mattel toy line, and that's why it looks similar to the one in the Lego toy line. That's why it looks similar to the one in Jurassic World Evolution. Oh wow! They basically decided that the standard Green Velociraptor, although we've never really seen them, but like if there were wild raptors in Jurassic World made in the Jurassic World era, that is what they would look like. Wow, that I feel like that answers a lot of questions for some people. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, (laughs) I thought that was a pretty interesting approach. Uh, um, yeah. Well, and also there's the lost. I mean, has it been conf- I mean, it looks like the Lost World Velociraptor. Okay. So it looks like the Lost World Velociraptor when I saw it on the back of the packaging. When I saw the production prototype that they had on display, it looks like it's more or less paying homage to the Lost World Velociraptor. But I don't think it's actually entirely that dinosaur. Like, I think if they do a Lost World Velociraptor, they'll, they will be a little bit more accurate. It's a great looking toy. I like it more than the green Raptor. Um, the paint job feels a lot more Jurassic park. Um, and honestly, like I like it for a neutral toned Raptor. I, I hope that maybe that color and paint scheme might be represented in Jurassic world evolution as well. Like maybe that'll be like, Oh, that's the other type of neutral Raptor that we're dealing with. Yeah. I prefer um, it too. Definitely. A- a- as far as I can tell, that one is a repaint of blue from the attack pack. Oh, um, but uh, they weren't, really ready to talk about like the legacy collection yes that was my other question um um, obviously it's happening i mean you you saw the one promo image where there was dr alan grant yeah and um Uh, classic dilophosaurus and a lost world pachycephalosaurus i don't know if it's happening sometime this year if it's a retailer exclusive or if it's like been pushed to 2019 or maybe a little bit of both um well, but they're not ready to they're not ready to talk about that quite yet. Obviously, you can bank on it happening. 
um, because the Mattel toy line is going to be a sustained toy line. This is not just going to be a one-shot thing where it's going to be, oh, there's a toy line now, and then there's a toy line in 2021 with Jurassic World 3, which was just announced yesterday. What? No, this will be <laughs> this will be a sustained toy line. Um, I would assume that movie years are going to be a lot larger than non-movie years, but the idea is to really sustain and sort of build with the expanded universe and also dig into the past. So try to make all those dinosaurs that appeared in the movies... Um, make dinosaurs that didn't appear in the movies. Maybe if there's a fan favorite from Jurassic World Evolution, maybe that could be in their sustain line. You know, like maybe that Deinonychus uh, from Jurassic World Evolution will eventually get a toy oh, cool. as part of their sort of expanded toy line. But uh, it will be very clear in the non-movie years, the packaging will sort of shift to indicate, hey, this is a non-movie year covering a wider variety from the Jurassic universe, the greater expanded Jurassic universe. But the idea is to really give a expanded play pattern and for these to really become the definitive dinosaur toys on the market um, and to really give a really good play pattern option to uh, kids and a good collectible option for, you know, the older fans. Yeah, I mean, really, you know, I think that was the, you know, the sort of bummer about the Jurassic World toys is that they just felt so basic and so, I mean... The quality of these feel nice. So, like, the Mattel rep, like, like well... For one thing, they were dropping the Owen figure from, like, you know, <laughs> human height. Like, and he was just fine. He wasn't breaking. He still felt great. They were kind of tossing around. The Mattel rep, like, he was um grabbing the, like, he would just kind of throw, like, the attack back dinosaurs, like, a few feet onto the table, and it would hit the other dinosaurs. None of them were breaking. None of them were looking worse for the wear. Like, it was showing, like, yo, these kids are going to play with these toys and look at them. Even the small basic ones are durable. Like, they have good articulation. You can pose them how you want, and they're not going to break. They look great, they display great, they play great, and they're durable, and they're cheap. and But they're not cheaply made. And it just sort of blows my mind, because the Hasbro toys were super, super fragile. Yeah, no, those their, were... Their play features were wonky, they didn't really work, they were hollow, poorly painted, very fragile. This is the complete opposite. They, I honestly, from a... Uh, I think that the, Mattel really changed the game with the standard industry, industry standard right now. I think that Hasbro is really going to have to catch up with even their Star Wars toys um, because Mattel is offering so much more at more competitive price points um, in way higher level quality. I don't know what they did, but they really brought toys back to sort of that magic era um, when they were both affordable and incredibly high quality that we haven't seen in like the past like eight or nine years, ten years or so. Yeah, no, it's I mean, again, even just from the pictures, I'm just very I mean, I'm so impressed. Yeah, and the Stigamola, like you said, um, that is probably my favorite attack pack dinosaur so far. Mine too. The detail is great. I mean, she looks just like the version in the movie. Um, a lot of great articulation, great paint job. Um, feels really nice. Like all the plastic feels like the right weight. It's not hollow. It's not cheap feeling. Um, it, you know, just it's a good quality plastic. And um, yeah, she's apparently they. She has a name, Stiggy. Stiggy. Just like Velociraptor Blue, you know, that says Velociraptor, and then in parentheses it says Blue. This one says Stiggy in, par- um, not parentheses, I'm sorry, quotation marks. Quotation um, marks. <laughs> but they, they say they expect her to be a breakout character. Ah, I'm um, so excited. In the movie. So she gets a more prominent featured role. Um, and Mattel described her as a bundle of energy, um, a bundle of explosive energy, mm-hmm. sort of like a Tasmanian devil who just sort of runs around and destroys everything in her path. Um, but they expect her to sort of ha- have a following because I think, I think you're rooting for her is what's really happening. Like, I don't think like she's like a trained dinosaur. I don't think she's a good guy. She's just an animal being an animal, but I think you as an audience are going to root for her because I think ultimately she's going to end up kind of destroying the stuff of the bad guys just by coincidence. Um, so I think that she's going to be a really cool character to see in the movie uh and plus i really like the idea of a featured herbivore and i love the design yeah um i think it might be my favorite design in jurassic world fallen kingdom i mean just um you know i just from just from the toy even i'm and in Stig- instigamolic and carnotaurus are t- two of my you know of my top di- favorite dinosaurs to s- so that we're gonna get a movie with both of them in it and both of them being featured dinosaurs just just for me personally, yeah. just makes me so excited about this movie. And, you know, that's something that's really interesting is, like, you know, fan, fan favorites like the Carnotaurus, like, that's not lost on Universal. I mean, for one thing, they mentioned, like, they knew the Carnotaurus was a fan favorite dinosaur. 
and they knew it's been requested for all these years. So they really wanted to make sure that when they featured it, they featured it right. And they also made a really kick-ass toy out of it. Um, and they did that. And just like, it's kind of worth noting, they are on, you know, Jurassic Outpost reading your comments, um, on Reddit reading the comments, uh, everywhere, really. Like reading the comments, good and bad, weighing them, uh, amused by them, <laughs> taking them into consideration, a little bit of everything. But I mean, they are there. It's not like they are some sort of big name, faceless corporation that just doesn't, no, no, no. Like they are very much individual people who very much know these different fields and are passionate about these items, about these films, about the lore, and are really trying to, uh, they're, they're, they're really working from the ground up, essentially, like from the fans in moving forward with that. I mean, I mean, I know that so many fans are going to be, are just, I mean, you know, I'm me personally over the moon about that because it's like, there are times where we feel like the redheaded stepchild franchise and, and it's just nice. Exactly. And it's just nice to know that at least on some small part, on some level, they are starting with the success of Jurassic world and in this big push into fallen kingdom that, that there's going to be this level of um, care that we we've wanted from the beginning, but maybe we've had to kind of not earn it, but just that it's, it's had to be wait for it. Yeah. We've had to wait for it a little bit. And so that's really nice to hear. Uh, It's really nice to hear you say that, that, that from the people who are making this stuff that they really do care. Like that's, that's, that makes me really happy. Exactly. No, I mean, I'm definitely there with you. And I, I really left with, um, not just from a sense of the quality of items on display, but also just all the conversations I had, I, I left with such a, um, a, a really great feeling about the future of the franchise. Um, especially when it came to the expanded universe pushing and like sort of branding and merchandising. Like I really definitely left with such a um, level of appreciation and faith of where things are going. That's awesome. Um, which is super important in my opinion. Yeah. I mean, we've talked about that before a few times and, uh, I, I was curious one thing about the Claire's evolution and I was like looking at the, at the, the, the YA book that's sort of the tie in that shows the pre it's a prequel of Claire mm-hmm. is 19 and she's, it's her internship on Isla Nubar and it's kind of her adventures, uh, her first adventures with Misrani. Um, and I was like looking at the, I know the cover, it's not final, but the way that they're phrasing the, the, the title is the evolution of is in one font and Claire is in another. And I don't know if yeah. you got a sense or if there was even a rep there for the book, but like I could almost see it being the evolution of, and then insert different character names, you know, <laughs> it's really funny that you bring that up because I brought that up. Um, I suggested, Hey, is this something that you're interested in doing this with other characters? And they're like, yes, um, we're not really talking about that. And we're not necessarily saying that we're working on it, but it's something we're definitely considering. And we're really closely watching, um, the reception of this book essentially. Oof. Um, and, um, and I had suggested, well, you know, another character, and I, not like I came up with this on my own, I'm sure they're thinking the same thing, another character that probably had a really interesting growth in a lot of uh, territory to explore is uh, Dr. Henry Wu. Yeah. Um, because, you know, you have this whole era of Jurassic Park to Jurassic World where he's done all these different things, and he's also grown from sort of a very wide-eyed, enthusiastic scientist who is incredibly smart to sort of this cynical yeah. <laughs> corporate creep. Um, so, like, th- there's definitely an evolution there as well. And also, we know that he's been involved with like, the cleanup of Jurassic Park, um, different genetic things, and then he, you know, he was brought in with Mizrani Global to start working on dinosaurs in 1998. You know, different things like that that I think that's incredibly important that you can just really follow his character arc um, through a wide era of Jurassic Park to Jurassic World and uh, really tell a lot of different great stories because he was there for it all, essentially. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Like, he he is a, a the linchpin or sort of the bridging of the two, you know, of these two distinct eras. Exactly, exactly. Um, so, And I think that he has the most room for growth because he's not as clearly defined in the films, but yet he's still a prominent character. So I think that's something that people would love to read. And you can really get that Michael Crichton-esque type of story from Henry Wu's arc, in my opinion. Oh, yeah, totally. And just the type of things that he deals with. I think that, that would give, like, the hardcore, like, Crichton science fans and, like, the kind of heavier science fiction fans of the Jurassic Universe something that they could really enjoy. Deep dive into sort of that that aspect of the lore. Yeah, I well, yeah, I mean, you could even 
draw from the original, you know, novels in that way. Uh, um, you know, in the sense of like Wu, how they drew from some of Wu's dialogue uh, with Hammond in the original book for Jurassic World, you could, you know, you could tease out more concepts like that. Yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, I'm really excited for the Claire novel. I'm really excited to read. I think that's going to be an interesting era to read about. I think it's going to be interesting to see how her character grows. Um, and most I, the setting, the setting of it sounds fantastic. So I'm 100% on board. Um, it, it is 100% up my alley. Yeah, I think I think so, as far as when I, coming out of just this weekend, um, I think Stiggy and Carnotaurus and the this in the Evolution of Claire book were kind of my top three, my top three kind of, I can't wait to get my hands on this kind of thing. Exactly. I'm very much looking forward to that. I believe they said that comes out May 8th. Um, oh, cool. Somewhere around there, it comes out before the movie. That's cool. Um, That's really cool. You know, because usually these tie-in novels and stuff, they kind of like, you know, day of like really just protecting. Exactly. Well, since since this is set before Jurassic World, um, they, they were willing to bring it out ahead of time. That's cool. Um, which I'm very excited about. But um, anyhow, like I'm trying to think of a few other key notes. Like the, uh, the Indoraptor, they said that they sort of wanted to make the motion and the posability. I guess it's sort of, it has inspiration from big cats. Ooh. Like um, pre- big predatory cats. So uh, I guess it gets that sort of prowling motion. So that should be really interesting to see. Yeah, in the movie. Um, yeah, exactly. And they wanted to translate that to the toy. Um, oh, the every single dinosaur has a QR code, at least in the main toy line, has a QR code that sort of looks like a DNA strand underneath their feet. There's gonna be a fo- there's gonna be an app called the Jurassic Facts app. Ugh. Fact Facts app. <laughs> um, so you scan it, and then you then you own it in the in the uh, app. Um, you can learn about it, but in that app, you can also become like you start as like a novice, and you can work your way up to an expert, and you unlock different views and different options with the dinosaurs and different facts about them. As you take these quizzes, and these quizzes can be pretty difficult. I saw some demos of them about different dinosaurs, real world facts about the dinosaurs. It wasn't like I didn't see any Jurassic Park facts. In fact, it was like more real world facts. Oh wow! And then. And then you can kind of unlock more options with each dinosaur that you own. Um, as well as every dinosaur that is in the toy line that is scannable is in the app, like as a silhouette. Um, I saw quite a few. There are definitely some there that we did not see pictures of yet. So I'm interested to see what they are. Ooh. Um, and uh, what's cool is even if you don't own them, you can click on them and you hold a flare, like a Jurassic Park style flare in front of them. You can slightly illuminate them and like, you can move the flare around so you can get an idea of what the design is. And you can find out the name of the item. So if you're like, oh, I really want to unlock this dinosaur, you know exactly what toy you need to buy, which is really, really cool. Wow. But uh, the idea is to integrate learning and um, kind of a, pl- a different form of play factor into the toys and collectability. So you have that digital collectability as well as learning and um, and sort of collecting into that. Well, so, well it's just cool. Think- it's cool because it's bridging the kind of the two worlds that, you know, the, exactly that we love jurassic park and we love dinosaurs because we we do want to learn about them and that's what we were obsessed with as kids you know just learning all the facts and you know you know reading dinosaur encyclopedias but then they're kind of mixing it with obviously it's 2018 and you know everybody who's i mean any i mean now everybody from all ages is using has iphones or had you know Uh uses their parents ipad and you know, the, so you can bring your dinosaur toys, a living version of them, with you on the go. Yeah. You can interact with them, and then you can start to unlock more features with them, which is, I think it's a really, really cool app. I think it's going to be great. I see, I believe, I bet you people will start requesting a battle feature, though. Yeah, I know. People battle their dinosaurs, so I know. That, that should definitely be waived, like, year two on that. Yeah, I'm like, because, I mean, just my natural, my mind goes to, like, is there going to be, like, a Pokemon Go version of this i i think i honestly hope that this app catches on i hope that it's part of their sustain program and i do hope that they continue to add different elements to it because if they add a battle feature i think people are going to go nuts with that even if it's really simplistic i think that's a lot of fun keep the learning involved but just let there be a play factor to the the game is an app as well that would be cool um okay so there was that which i just covered i'm trying to think um uh any um can you talk any anything about talking to Funko or their their situation? Um, yeah. So Ellie Sattler, she 
They're hoping to have her approved. Universal did not approve her yet. Um, so they're working with Universal to get the final approval on that. I didn't figure out why. If I had to guess, though, it might have been because the toy just says Jurassic Park cheap. <laughs> um, oh, it's so, so insulting. I, I, I think that the idea is to give Ellie a little bit more of a uh, room in the limelight. She was originally supposed to come out with the main wave, but she's going to be kind of like she's just going to when she comes out, she'll come out. I don't know. Maybe it'll be with the Jurassic World lineup. Um, at this point, it's just, I'm not entirely certain, but it's happening. Um, it, she is coming out. They're not exactly sure when, um, they weren't really able to talk more about that. Sure. Yeah. Um, I mean, and that's one of the things too, you know, and, and what I have personally just been, you know, I, just for the record, like I'm not going to buy, I mean, like I don't, I don't want to buy any of the Funko pops and I mean, the dinosaurs are creepy, but the, <laughs> with the big heads and everything. But like, I personally was like, I'm not going to buy any of the Funko pops until this Ellie figure is released because <laughs> she is, she is the trio. Like in, in the idea exactly. that she got shortchanged in such that way just felt so insulting to me. And I, I get the feeling that we will get a, a solo version of Ellie Sattler as well. Um, yeah. It, I, I think that they will address that head on and learn from that and release like a solo version of Ellie Sattler. So not only is she a vehicle, but she'll be like a headliner of like a wave to a Jurassic park. Um, they're definitely very excited for Jurassic park and it's definitely going to be an ongoing uh, line is assuming it actually sells. And let's be honest, it's selling as far as they can tell it's doing great. Um, so they, they think it'll absolutely be an ongoing line. Um, they announced some Jurassic world items. It yeah. was blue Owen and Claire. Um, there's more to the line. If I were to be honest with you, I believe it is a Stigamolic, an Indoraptor, and a Gyrosphere. Oh, a Gyros... Oh, you mean like a, as like a vehicle? Yeah, yeah. Got it. Um, <clears throat> I, I'm not entirely positive if it's a Gyrosphere, but I know there's a vehicle. I know there's two other dinosaurs. One was called a Villain Dino, and the other one was called a Hero Dinosaur. <laughs> so um, if I had a guess, that would be the Stigamolic and the Indoraptor. And a Gyrosphere just makes sense because it's that sort of trademark jurassic world vehicle yeah we're not going to get um, the uh the the rescue rig or something it, exactly i mean it would be cool if you had maybe the truck with the t-rex line on the back of it though that could be interesting. that would actually be really cool i'd be into that um the uh other bit of information that i did not get was in the promo images they put out blue had black eyes but in the prototype on the floor blue had yellow eyes i wasn't able to get an answer of what color her eyes were going to be <laughs> in the final product if I had to guess, it would be black eyes, though, because the yellow eyes make her a little scarier looking. And since she's supposed to be an empathetic character, the black eyes help with that. Oh, totally. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah. Um, I'm trying to remember what her eye color is in the movie. Like off- They're like orangish. They're orangish. But I feel like for the Funko, making them black would make sense just because it gives it a little bit more of that empathetic like more of like less of a scary nightmare creature. Um, yeah, no, no. Like, more, the, Vel- more- like the Velociraptor pop. Um, like literally looks like a demon from hell. No, I, yeah, I, I, I don't think I would get any of the dinosaurs to be honest. Cause they're just such a, I mean, Funko's <laughs> just work well for a certain, you know, human figure. And I feel like all the creature Funko's are well, scary. If looking. you see them in person, if you see them in person, they actually, they, they work more than you would expect. Okay. Um, I, I do think they're pretty, pretty cool and cute looking. They're a little great desktop item. And the dinosaurs are pretty unique because they are quite Jurassic Park. And there's something about having that sort of super deformed Jurassic Park figure <laughs> dinosaur on your desk that uh, really, really pulls it together. Yeah, I mean, again, um, like you said, they, they are going to come out with an Ellie. And, and, and I knew that they were going to come out with an Ellie. So I'm just I just wanted I just want them to announce it officially, you know. I just yeah. I feel like I'm still waiting for that, and I want them to address it. Exactly. They, they, the reason why they haven't been, um, the reason why they haven't talked about it is because they're waiting on the final approval and we're like waiting on getting everything, um, sort of worked out. That makes sense. Um, so that that is why we haven't heard more about Ellie, but she's certainly coming, and at least Claire is part of the, um. Uh, the standard Jurassic World. Oh yeah, I mean um, it just collection like right there in front and center. So uh, <laughs> there's four Owens and no Claire. Shit, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so like we're not dealing with something like that. So yeah, I'm pretty, uh, I, I'm pretty pleased with what's coming there. The Lego items were really high quality, really nice. They didn't really impress me too much. They sort of felt like a reskinned Jurassic World, um, especially because the vehicles are all just sort of real world vehicles. They sort of felt like they could have been part of their Lego city, city line. <laughs> and then they just like threw, threw a dinosaur and a minifigure in there with it. But um, 
they, they didn't really have any innovative play patterns that I'm used to with Lego. They're all quite flat. They sort of felt like facades or like a moving vehicle. The vehicles were nice, but there weren't any like play sets with fun play patterns. Um, yeah. So the Lego figures, they were nice. It's just like that, that Lockwood Manor, it's like 130 $140 or something like that. And it just did not look like it to me. Um, it was nice. It had a lot inside of it, but it was just a big flat element on the front and then like little rooms on the back. But like the Hogwarts castle for like a little bit less has more minifigures and it has more complexity to the build of it, um, that they had on display at toy fair. And I really found that one impressive. Oh, wow. I just felt like, um, I just felt like it didn't quite capture the allure, um, of Jurassic park or, um, Jurassic world. So, yeah. especially when you see what Lockwood Manor looks like, you know, it's not like a flat building. Like, this makes it look like the front end of, like, a, one of those basic brick elementary schools <laughs> where they're super flat. They just kind of go up a little bit and, like, there's nothing interesting to the architecture. Like, this is an inter- architecturally interesting um, building in the movie. And it's sort of like a flat facade in the Lego thing. But there are some cool play features, like the uh, the glass dome window on the top. Like, you press a switch and it swings down. Huh. You press another switch and like a bookcase or something falls over and flips over on top of Maisie. Um, and then the Indoraptor can pop in through a window, like uh, into Maisie's room or something oh, like cool. that. So there are some, um, there are some really cool things. There are like the diorama displays. Um, there, there are printed decals so you can see a Dimetrodon diorama display and like Raptors and a T-Rex diorama display. Like in one of the glass panels, they have a brick build of the large Triceratops skull. So they're like, there are a lot of cool things there. It's just, I wish it was more presentable and interesting, and I wish that the play the play factor and the um the play pattern had a little bit more happening there. Yeah, it's um, it, it's it's that thing of like, all right, well you're going for this collectability thing, then make it have it be more like you're saying aesthetically pleasing, or if you're going to make it more playable, have it actually have more stuff like that where you know uh, it's just hard not to judge when they do such a good job with like star wars and harry potter and all these other sets like you really when you see what lego can do there's nothing necessarily wrong with these sets but they just sort of feel like like sort of lego city vehicles um or like really simple build sets but they're not simple they are complex they've got a ton of pieces it's just they don't really necessarily pull the what makes Jurassic park special i guess what? but uh, i think i think they're nice i think kids are going to love them um, I think collectors will like them as well. And I think Lego fans really like them for the diversity that they, um, offer, but just for like the, the fan like me, I felt like they could offer a little bit more. Also, I wasn't a fan of the Carnotaurus. The art <laughs> style doesn't look right. Um, it's too big, but also the other thing is it's art style. This doesn't look right. It doesn't look like the other Lego dinosaurs. It looks more like it would be like a Duplo Carnotaurus <laughs> rather than a Carnotaurus. So I don't like it. Yeah. The, um, the Stigamolic on the other hand looks great. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, I mean, and the Indoraptor looks pretty good as well. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah, it's again, we're we're very lucky this time to have a wealth of options, and I think for me personally, it's really easy just to be like, I'm not going to get any of the Legos. It just makes it easier for for me, just thinking about it financially, thinking about it space wise, thinking about it just in my brain, what I actually like a lot, and it's just for me personally, I feel like yeah, the it, like you're saying, it just makes it really easy for you to you know to seeing what lego is capable of and seeing what we've been presented with overall for Jurassic World fallen kingdom so far it's like the legos just kind of feel perfunctory overall in the grand uh, yeah the, the, they, they are good they are good they're just not wow yeah great you know um which the mattel toys are like wow these are great on every level from a collector to a child to a price point if you're a parent who's wanting to buy the toys all their different play patterns, you know, they also have Imagine X, they have Hot Wheels, they have Matchbox, they have Kamigami, which are these little electronic robots that you build and then you control via an app. Um, they have the Tyranodrone, they have the Hashlings, which come out of the eggs, yeah. and they have, like, little features like Blue eats pellets and poops them out. <laughs> uh, the Triceratops, its horns grow. Um, what else was there? Uh, you know, there was the anatomy kit. That anatomy yes. kit of the T-Rex, that's an action figure. It is the size... Although it's technically a stem toy, it is the size of a thrash and throw T-Rex. Wow. And it is an action figure. Like, you can build it and it's, like, articulated and everything like that. Um, they have the RC vehicles. There's even more RC vehicles. There's a Jurassic Park Jeep with a net launcher. There's a die-cast Jurassic Park Jeep, which is extremely heavy and looks beautiful. Um, and it's all scaled to the three and three-quarter inch humans. Again, like, this cross-play pattern is just something that I haven't seen done. 
There's a uh, RC Textron. There's um. There's even these Titan. I don't. They're like twelve inch tall, like ten dollar items or so, and they're like sort of like dolls. But there's like Velociraptors and the uh, Pachycephalosaurus and Owen, and uh, they're plastic and they're out of scale. The rest of the line, but they're great. They're cheap and they're going to display wonderfully. Um, unfortunately, those weren't uh, in the area with photos. Oh, okay. But, um, um, there's the plushies that look really good. Plushies, yeah, the plushies look great. Um, yeah, forget porgs. Forget I, porgs. You know, we got we got baby blue and we got Stiggy this time. So I think the thing that was missing out of all these ranges, there was no one one baby blue. They were really missing a trick by releasing something that looks like baby blue from the movie and about the same size as baby blue with a certain play pattern. Um, because they're hatchling baby blue, it's part of it's a little bit stylized and it's also small. Yeah. Um, so they're missing that sort of. I don't know, foot and a half long, two foot long, foot and a half tall, baby blue toy. Um, whether or not it was a plush, a toy, an animatronic, something, that is the one thing that I was struck by. Like, this is going to be such a breakout character with fans, um, but she's not there. And, oh, to be clear, they 100%, oh, baby blue is from a flashback scene. It is blue wow. as a baby when she when she imprints onto Owen, and Owen imprints onto her, um, um, and that is a flashback scene. That is not Blue's baby. That is baby Blue. Wow. Confirmed. We have it Have um, it here, folks. <laughs> why Owen is wearing the same clothes during that scene as he is in Fallen Kingdom, I have no damn clue. He just really likes that outfit. I mean, he's a smelly guy. Uh, <laughs> I, I, apparently. I don't even know where he found those clothes <laughs> all those years later. Um, but yeah. Well, um, I, I was going to say, I mean... Y- because the Groot, I think the Groot dancing Groot didn't come out immediately exactly. after the movie, That's so maybe true. there's maybe there's room for them to be as they're leading up to the release of Fallen Kingdom. That's maybe something they're cooking up in that lab. I, I hope. I hope that by the time the end of this year rolls around, that there is a Baby Blue um, toy that actually looks like Baby Blue. It's cute and it has some sort of play factor. Like imagine like a real feel. One one baby blue, like no electronics or anything, but just like sort of poseable and cute or something along those lines. <laughs> My child. Or maybe some of those, or maybe some of those electronic noises where it has that sort of purring noise that she makes. Um, I, I'd love it. Oh, I'd love it. I hope it happens. Um, that would be amazing. I'm trying to think, I because we should really wrap this up here. So, are there any like? any rapid fire questions i mean i feel yeah. like you answered a lot of my a lot of my questions as we chatted about it um i mean i you know i love trading cards but i'm also like well all right i guess if the only type of trading cards we're gonna get are with those jelly belly uh the only type i saw were with the jelly bellies yeah. and they're like within these chocolate dinosaur eggs there's i think they're lentacular cards so they sort of got that holographic thing and they're using iom renders on special backgrounds they from the little display image they look pretty nice there might be more on display, and there were there were booths where I couldn't take photos. So there were some like science, technology, um, st- like STEM products of like excavation kits that weren't Mattel um, for Jurassic World: Fallen Kingdom. There are also some novelty items. I think they're called like Hatchems and Smashems and a few other things like where they're going to be on like those end caps at like Walmart and Target with like a little egg, and you open it up, and it's going to be a blind bag type of like super deformed like miniature dinosaur. <laughs> The, the prototype they had was an Indoraptor in a, in a uh, blue, but they're very stylized. Um, so there are going to be a lot of different things. I saw a lot of other, other booths with Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom graphics. However, they weren't really, they didn't have anything on display and they weren't really ready to talk about it. Um, oh, I was going to. So. Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, you know, I mean, obviously the the volcano imagery is very present throughout the very packaging popular. and everything. But was there anything volcano? I mean, not a volcano action figure, but was there like, is there anything uh, volcano related as like an actual product? There, there was a playset um, for Mattel that apparently got canceled because retailers were afraid it was too much shelf space. I think Mattel was in the process of downsizing it when they eventually canceled it. Um, oh, wow. And uh, maybe it'll come back. But uh, yeah, it was apparently huge. <laughs> so <laughs> like huge, huge, huge. Um, however, I-, I would love to see that. Uh, there was a board game with a volcano on it from um, Cardinal Games. It was kind of cool. Cool. Uh, y- yeah, that's what I saw for the volcano. It's uh, That's an- another thing I'd like to see. Oh, some other little keynotes is like the packaging art on the Mosasaur and the submarine 
and like the Mosasaur submarine matchbox set. Apparently the patchbox the packaging art is sort of reminiscent of a key scene in the film. They wouldn't say what that meant, but Ooh. they did want us to know that it is a key scene in the film. So look out uh, folks. You know. Uh yeah, so there there's some interesting things like that. Like they they want us to know exactly they want us to know that these are very re- representative of moments in the movie without like exact details. Well, yeah, yeah, that's always the thing with the toys is that there's always a little bit of like, you know, with Lego, we got a Dilophosaurus chasing set in the Jurassic World line, which didn't come out to be anything. So I always feel like you got to take it a little bit with a grain of salt when you're looking at these toys and thinking about exactly and exactly like the Rarosaurus, the Dilophosaurus, certain things like that. But the ones called story packs, like they are based on that and the packaging art sort of reflects that. And um, yeah, they wanted to build like the key movie characters and vehicles, they wanted to make sure they sort of built them around the theme that the movie kind of features. That's cool. And do you, um, I mean, other than the figures kind of dropping around April 16th, did you get a sense or, or from talking to people when some of these other products are starting to drop or is it, is it going to be a gradual rollout kind of starting now? Gradual rollout. Some of the items you won't see until May, June and so on and so forth. Some of the stuff is timed to come out with the Blu-ray release in October. Um, things along those lines. Um, and, um, I, I do want to go through a quick little list. Like, uh, at, there were some toys that I don't, I think people were wondering what the species was. So, uh, at, at Toy Fair for the Mattel, there was a, the small little mini ankylosaur species is a Minmi. There was a, um, what was the other dinosaur that people were questioning? Uh, proto Cer- Oh, The, the pro- Proceratosaurus. That yeah. one, I would like to see them re-sculpt. It looks some, like it kind of came out like the Land Before Time or Dinosaur Terrain. Yeah, it's a little cartoony. Um, it's, it's a it's a fine-looking dinosaur toy. There's nothing wrong with the quality. It just doesn't look like a Jurassic Park or a Jurassic World dinosaur at all. Yeah. <laughs> so I would be very happy if that toy never releases and it gets a different sculpt entirely. Um, but it really desperately needs a different sculpt. Um... There was the Minmi. I think there's another dinosaur that was next to the Pro- Minmi. Protoceratops. People... Oh, Protoceratops. Great sculpt. Needs a different paint job. <laughs> um, same same with the Minmi. It needs a different paint job. Yeah, I mean, um, I mean it's it, it, it's a it's a challenge to sort of. That's the thing I've noticed is that there's this challenge now that we've gotten more dinosaurs than ever. So it's like, how do you differentiate them? We, well, it's weird. These Wave Two dinosaurs or these uh, Fall dinosaurs. Some of them have these really bright garish colors and I just kind of get the feeling that they might have just been painting them however just to get the prototype ready um like the ankylosaurus great looking toy that desperately needs a different paint job because it just it looks so basic compared to the rest of the toys there and it's not really the right color but it's such a great looking toy I it was an earlier prototype because it sound didn't work and you can tell that it wasn't like quite the same plastic as the other ones oh Huh. So I would assume that that final toy is going to look up to the quality of the rest of the Roar Vores. That's cool. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, there's a few of them that like, the only toy that I was like, man, that needs a different sculpt is the Proceratosaurus. Um, the Sukumimus I have weird feelings about because it's a great looking <laughs> sculpt, but it's so, it looks like a hybrid. Yeah. Um, and the paint job makes it look like it's out of a cartoon. Yeah. Um, and that's sort of the same thing with the Protoceratops and the Minmi. Like, those could use some different paint jobs because they're very garish. And then the Ankylosaurus was just very basic. Like, it looks like it didn't have its final colors on it. Yeah, I mean, compared to the um, Stegosaurus and the Carnotaurus toys, like the Sukumimus. The Pachyrhinosaurus toy was probably one of my favorite. It was beautifully sculpted based off of the real dinosaur Pachyrhinosaurus. Um, it, it, it just looks fantastic. Weirdly, it has the paint job of the Sinoceratops, so I don't know what's going on. I don't know what's going on there right now, but um, it's a great-looking toy. In the image that Entertainment Weekly put out, it had a different paint job, which we can consider the definitive Pachyrhinosaurus paint job, I think. Okay. Um, uh, but, uh, yeah, no, 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 it, it's a great-looking toy. Um, the Tyrandon Growler looks great, nice size, painted like the movie. Um, yeah, the only I think the only one that I'm like, oh, I want to see another one because I didn't quite get it would probably be the Velociraptors because they look good. They just don't look great yet. Uh, yeah, I mean, the bar's set pretty high. Ex- exactly. They're Velociraptors, man. We're going to hold a really high standard <laughs> to them. Uh, um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to think if there's any other dinosaurs. No sauropods. No sauropods. That's actually one of the things that people have been asking and requesting the most. Um <sighs> I don't know. Sounds like there might have been one at a point in time and it was like too risky. 
But I think now that this line is so successful and people are responding to it so positively, I think there is a way to get a decent budget um, large sauropod um, because there is no sauropod and there's no um, there's no Parasaurolophus or um, and Montosaurus or anything along those lines in the toy line also. So there is, it, um, isn't there mini fig? Isn't there a mini fig pair like um like in those yeah, like, yeah. cheap plastic packs? Like isn't there a Parasaurolophus yeah, well, for that? And also, I do want to speak to those mini figures. They're really nice. They each have one point of articulation. They have a ton of detail. They have at least like three or four different paint colors on them. Um, they're really nice. There is a, a Patasaurus in that. There's um, a Parasaurolophus. I have the Parasaurolophus, and I have the Stegosaurus actually. Oh, really? You got you um, got, They gave you they gave you something. For yeah, it. yeah. I got two little blind bags. I got to open them. Oh, that's um, so cool. And they look great. Uh, yeah, and there's like a there's I think it's gonna be like every dinosaur from the movie uh, eventually up until like even some interesting surprising ones that aren't in the movie like uh, Postosuchus. Oh, cool. Um, well, my wallet is, uh, my wallet's already empty at this point. (laughs) Um, yeah. So I, I'm hoping that I covered things that people wanted to hear. I mean, we were, Um, we were, we were pretty comprehensive. Uh, yeah. Otherwise is the toys, the plastic feels good. It's high quality. They're like, they're not hollow. They're the right weight. Everything along those lines, um, is wonderful. That's so exciting. So I, I think that, yeah, I think that there is a lot to be excited about. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. It's... And I, I, I'm definitely very much sold on these items and keep in mind, I found some of those leaked images to be kind of disheartening. So I am definitely being critical uh, on them. And when I say critical, I mean, they're just fantastic. There's really nothing else I could say. And kids are just going to be offered such a great standard of play. So I can't wait. Mattel has kicked ass. Yeah. Um, and Universal has done a fantastic job and the future is looking really bright. And I cannot wait to talk about this more once they're officially released. I mean, yeah, the April is, is, you know, soon, soon it's, this is right around the, qu- like, that's what's so crazy to me. It's like, we're talking about this now, but it's like, these are literally going to be, they're going to, they're going to fill up Target and Toys R Us. They're going to fill up those, you know, I can already see this section at Target where, you know, where they would actually sit. And it's just like, that'll just be so exciting to be able to just go into, to just go into a store and just see Jurassic, Jurassic Park toys again. Oh, another little thing. It sounds like the Parasaurolophus might be featured in Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom. People are worried that it wouldn't be in the movie. Sounds like it should get like a cameo or something. Um, but, um, that's awesome. Yeah. Man, this has been awesome. This has been really fun, Chris. I'm, I'm, I hope, yeah, I, I feel like listeners will be super pleased with all the, the, the small details and those things that you picked up on that, you know, you know, that you can't really get, you know, you were again, like at the beginning, just like you were there on the ground. And so it, it I'm sure listeners can be super appreciative of, of those little attention to detail things that you picked up on. Um, not only from just talking to people, but also from just, you know, Again, like we're, you know, you're going to like, we're going to really hold those toys up close and, and inspect them closely to make sure that they're. Yeah. And once I can get a review sample or something like that, like I'm going to take really nice studio shots of every little detail where I can have the camera on a tripod, get that super focus and get every little detail to people. But um, those items that were at least at the Universal event on Friday, they were final items. They were production models and the quality is fantastic. Um, some of the stuff at Toy Fair were definitely earlier prototypes. Most of them were production models, but some weren't. So, oh wow, cool. Well, awesome. Um, well, I think we covered everything I could. I'm sure I'm afterwards gonna be like, wow, how did I forget about talking about this and this and this? And somehow ran a two hour long podcast. Oh God, we did it. Um, um, so thank you for joining me. Um, can you tell people where they can follow you in case they don't know already? Yeah. Um, thank you again, Chris. Um, yeah, you can follow me on. Twitter and Instagram at Stephen Ray Morris. And if you haven't listened to see Jurassic, right, it's my Jurassic Park podcast. That's really just about, you know, the memories that we had growing up about the franchise. And, you know, I've been lucky to have Chris on and Assis and just sharing their own stories and, and a lot of my friends and some other people. And we're going to have Lauren Lapkus on soon. Um, I interviewed her about her experience on Jurassic world. So um, check it out. It's, it's a lot of fun and, it's just uh, I love just hearing people's Jurassic Park stories. So, um, yeah, check it out. See Jurassic right. All right. Well, thank you again so much for joining me. Thank you for trying to keep me on topic. Um, 
uh we, we we definitely made a long one here but um this has been in general podcast episode 69 stay tuned because episode 70 will probably be coming out shortly and we need to cover a lot like the second fallen kingdom trailer jurassic world 3 being announced and quite a few other things so um thanks for listening and until next time